You may be seated. Welcome once again to the last night of our 2024 Vision Conference. It's so good to see you, and uh, I'm I'm thank I'm thankful uh, for all the messages we've had, the challenges we've had, all the many things that God is doing uh, this week. And uh, one of the things that really uh, was encouraging last night as uh, Rick Osborne preached was just that Philadelphian message, right? As a message about uh, loving God, and loving others, and that's so important to get the mission done, accomplishing the mission. And, uh, you know, year after year, we have these conferences. I don't even know how many years now. I think we've probably had 20-plus uh, conference, vision conferences now uh, here at HBF, at least 20. Uh, we may be on our 21st. I'm not quite sure. And so uh, we've had these for a long time. I can remember just preaching my guts out about how important it is to cross rivers without bridges and, and really having no concept of how in the world our little church was going to have an impact in the world. But very quickly, God began to, to show us that, you know, he's, he's able, right? There's nothing impossible with God. And uh, he does things over exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. And, and yet, like I said last night, there's so much more to do. Uh, and we're not foolish enough to think that, oh, well, HBF can do all of this. We can, we can accomplish the mission. Uh, the, the harder you try, the more you realize, man, there's so much to do, and you feel like you have so little strength, which is why you got to have supernatural power from God's Spirit, right? That's the primary thing is focusing on the Lord. But secondarily, I think it's important that we recognize uh, what uh, many years ago Randy and I uh, coined parallel partners. And uh, parallel partners are people that God brings alongside, and you know, in Amos, uh, the Bible tells us in chapter 3 that, you know, two can't walk together unless they be agreed. So what makes parallel partners parallel partners is our doctrine, right? And, and so uh, we have a, faith, uh, a faith-based view of the Scripture, dispensational, uh, have the same heart for missions, uh, training men, making disciples, and, uh, and all those uh, fundamentals line up and we can walk together. Uh, and we can accomplish God's mission and God's power for God's glory. Now, God has given Heartland a very broad uh, group of relationships of parallel partners. Uh, many of them, of course, are in their Living Faith Fellowship, but we also have many outside of that due to Bible publishing and other ministries that God has kind of uh, expanded our borders a little bit, which is a, an incredible privilege and opportunity. And I'm thankful for that as, as well. And so what I want to do with this, this time that we have, and this isn't going to be too long, I just wanted to bring up some of our parallel partners. Um, and I think many of you know them, but many of you may not. So I wanted you to put faces with names since we didn't have a lot of time to highlight everybody that's been here uh, this week as our guests. Uh, I wanted to bring up um, some of the pastors, and you guys know who you are. Bo Green, uh, Alex Ch- Missionary Ap- Alex Chippy, uh, Mike Blake, Jay Boffman, and uh, Tom. Tom's in the house. Uh, I don't know where Thomas Thomas is he here? There he is on the front row. You guys just come up here and grab a seat. Uh, we're we're going to just uh, pepper them with a few questions, and these aren't going to be scary questions. We're not going to make him rehearse everything that Wagi taught uh, this earlier this week, but uh, I think they could recount it if I needed to. But anyway, uh, we had a, we've had a good session. So these guys, <clears throat> I think, am I missing anybody? I must. Who am I missing? No, Rick, Rick Osborne. Rick, come on up here, brother. I missed you. That's what I get for going off of my memory. Uh, so uh, now we got two missionaries and, and a church planner, three pastors. And so one of my first questions is, Bo, what is the craziest thing that Mike knows? I'm, I'm not going to get into that. So we can't end it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the mic, Rick. And we're just going to, we're just going to get to give, ask these guys a few questions. I'm going to stand down here since uh, they're on the, they're in the stage there. They're the, they're the focus of our attention. But uh, I'll start off on a positive note, uh, Rick. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, what is the most encouraging thing in your ministry right now? Besides being here? Yeah. Amen, because this has Amen. been a blessing. Amen. Um, wow. I would say uh, we're beginning to see the fruit of our labor. Amen. Um, we went to Liberia to plant churches, but I didn't plan on pastoring a church. My plan was to train nationals to pastor the churches. And so one of our students, our first church plant, Emmanuel Saywall is pastoring that church. Now we have another one of our students who eventually became his assistant. And now we're getting ready to plant another church with him. 
Another one of our students is actually one of our teachers now. And then Brenda's ministry of uh, training children's ministries within a number, almost I think 20, 22 churches and providing materials. She's trained a librarian lady who's well educated and she's pretty much taking over her ministry in doing the workshops and the training. And so that is just such an encouragement Amen. to see uh, the fruit of our labor and exactly what we went there to do is actually happening. And we praise God for that. Amen. Amen. You're now, supposed to drop the mic after that. Oh. <laughs> in that addition incredible. to working for Mike, what is the most encouraging thing? <laughs> wow. Um, that was incredible. Um, it is incredible. God's incredible. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'd say uh, I'm going to take a different, we could find lots of encouragements, but um, you know that passage where it says all the distressed, discontented men, uh, when David was on the run from Saul, they came to David and they winded up becoming his mighty men of valor. I've always looked at our, our little church as just kind of a bunch of misfits, <laughs> and yet we got some mighty men of, of valor. And well, our youth group, I've, I've been seeing God do some crazy, amazing things with the youth lately, and he's using the people I never would have guessed he'd use. He's not using the popular athletic kids. He's not using the influencers, the ones we always want to try. He's using the misfits, and I love it. That's how God works, and so I could share stories of just how he's been encouraging me lately with that, but it's the people I'd never guess, and so it's like God keeps giving me a, a gracious spanking reminding me of that's, that's how he works. Don't count them out. That's awesome. Uh, we just had our two-year anniversary as a church, March the 6th, and so that was really cool. A uh, lot of blessings, but what, what we did was, we don't really focus on numbers, but that's a good day to gather up numbers. And so we did a lot of um, the stats and figuring out where we've come, how we've grown. And probably my favorite number, and it's, it was so encouraging, is we have 150 people involved in one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And, and wow. it's not just me preaching. I mean, we stand on the Word of God. We stand on discipleship. Uh, but what really is at the core of what we do is everybody's involved in ministry. Just tons of people teaching the Bible through the week to each other, which mm -hmm. was just a great blessing. That's incredible. Uh, myself, God has brought somebody to work with. I can just say I have Barnabas. Ah. Because he, you see, sometimes he, the Judas also are there. Yeah. So it's a blessing if God brings Barnabas in your life. So I'm so thankful God has brought somebody in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. I would say uh, we got 160 people involved in. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was trying. I was trying. No, um, we, you know, we've had a, just a rough go of it, had our teeth kicked in quite a bit in the last three or four years, but here lately, the last probably three months, I would testify that we have had just like an abundance of like visitors walk into our door. Amen. Just like people, and you, people you've never, you'd think living in a little town, you'd see these folks, but it just joys my heart to know our county has 15,000 people, a lot of lost folks. And I don't know, as a pastor, I get concerned about who's left and who's not happy and yet God has lately has just been really encouraging me with just new life and fresh faces, you know. It's good, bro. It's good. Uh, so we're playing a church in Portland, and the thing that's most encouraging to me right now is uh, when you surrender to do something like that, you say, I'll go. You don't know what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. And well, the last trip that we took, we had two contacts that we know in Portland that took time off of work to come and evangelize with us which to me is just super meaningful, that it's not just me and our team and the people we're gonna send, but we've gotta get the locals involved there and they're already trying to meet their people, if you will. And one of those folks actually invited somebody that came to our Easter service and they have a connection with that person already. So it's just cool to see that stuff work out. You have no idea how it's gonna work out and God's already ahead of you. Amen. All right, man, that's good, guys. Thank you so much. Um, next thing I was gonna run across here is, is uh, are you, is there, is there any books that you're reading? Um, and I did throw it, if, you, if it's the Bible, that's great. I'm not going to penalize for that. But any other books maybe that you're reading or anything that you'd recommend we read that's encouraging right now for you? 
I guess we start with me, because so I got start the mic. With you. you got the mic, man. Uh, the, so th I've been reading a lot of church planning books lately, and uh, the most uh, impressive book to me lately is called Church Planning Thresholds. It's actually a pretty biblical, Baptistic perspective on church planning. There's a lot of information, but it's, su it's surprising how few people go to the Bible to give you information on how to plan a church. And so Church Planning Thresholds, it was a really good read for me. Uh, personally, I just read a, a book by Craig Groeschel um, called uh, Something About Leadership. Ah, it's in my Audible thing somewhere that was really good. And Craig Groeschel, you can take him or leave him for doctrine, but he's got good leadership principles. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I just finished uh, an old book by uh, Dr. James Dobson hmm. on, um, on parenting, and he, he's got some good, good ones, you know. And so... Uh, Parenting Isn't for Cowards is the one it was called, and I'm getting ready to do something on that, but probably my favorite book here recently that I finished up that is not a Christian man, it's actually a, a restaurant dude and an entrepreneur and a, a world-renowned chef that Will, Will Gadero, he wrote a book called Unreasonable Hospitality. It, it honestly, God had used it in my life so much. I've bought the book and have taken it to men in our community that, that run like little restaurants and stuff. I said, hey, dude, you got to read this. Wow. And like, it, I would think the guy was a believer. That's how powerful this book was. So unreasonable hospitality. Uh, as a church planter, I am in the book of Acts. Amen. Because that's where you can see how the church started and where advancing the kingdom is concerned. You can see all those things in the book of Acts. So it's the book I'm reading right now. Amen. He said you should have dropped the mic. Yeah. Please don't. <laughs> but he didn't dig it, yeah. Um, Hand it to me if you got to do that. <laughs> not a, I'm not a big book reader outside the Bible. Uh, no, it's just me. But uh, the latest book I read that was the greatest was called The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. Um, I, yeah. I was recommended to me by Brian Clark. And when I read it, it was just I felt like I was highlighting almost every page, all the stuff. Uh, very raw and honest. Marriage is hard work. Uh, anybody who paints it any differently is lying to you. And he just, he really goes through all that. And, and I love, he talks about the covenant uh, of marriage. And it was just good. It was very insightful. I uh, just finished a book called Church Plantology. Have you read that one? It, a lot of, yeah, some good wisdom in there. So, um, you guys want to switch seats? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably one of my favorite reads was a book by Tony Evans, Free at Last. A lot, a lot of just great, encouraging truths in there. And then um, a book that I like to read at nighttime, just when I'm not working, is uh, Long Live the King James. Not that this church needs it, but it's by Alan Shelby and uh, Greg Axe. They just wrote it. It's the first resource I've ever seen on the King James Bible that's like not like they're not jerks about it. Like, so if you got somebody who's struggling, give that book to them and uh, they, they do a great job of laying it out. So that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah, I'm not a big book reader either apart from uh, ministry uh, purposes, but I like anything of Francine Rivers. Um, it, it's hard for a book to grab me and her, her writings do, especially that was the, the Mark of the Lion I remember my daughter-in-law told me to read that, and she says, you got to make sure you read the first hundred pages, you know, and I mean, the first time I read about 50, and I put it down, and I said, okay, I'm going to try this again. I read the hundred, and then I was stuck. I, I read the whole first two books on my phone, because I was traveling, and then the, the third book, so I really like that. Um, you know, Oswald Chambers, up most for his highest, mm -hmm. okay, so I, I do that. Um, in my daily devotions every day and right now I'm reading his life story which is just really tremendous and I'm in, I'm enjoying that when I get a chance to read it good that's, that's good guys I I'm over here writing down all your book references and I I've read the long live the King James that's good that is a good book and uh, I've been encouraged to read Tim Keller's as well so you just that's twice, two witnesses, so i got to get yeah. in on that. Um, all right, next, next question then is, um, what heavy metal Christian music do you like, Rick? <laughs> I'm, 
I'm, I'm kidding. No. Uh, is there any Everything we've sang this week, <laughs> top, of, top of my list, I tell you. So is there any, anything, any song or any particular uh, thing right now? When I'm singing in public or if I'm singing in, in the private, shower? In the shower, doesn't matter to us. In the shower, it's to God be the glory, my right. tribute. I mean, I could really bellow that out. Awesome. Uh, in public? Um, boy, I tell you, amazing grace, how great thou art, great is thy faithfulness. Um, I guess something that really, really moves me, were not for grace, you know, the song, were not for grace, oh, oh yeah. man, you know, because that's, I think that's all our testimonies. <laughs> we, we know where we would be, were not for grace, and just, but man, I just, pretty much any hymn, you know, there, there's something there. Uh, about those, and I just, uh, I think as we get older, the songs move us even a little bit more too, don't Amen. they? They do. Uh, I'm not a big, huge Brandon Lake guy, but man, there's a song called Count 'Em that just every time it comes on, it fires me up. And I, I told Blake, I said, you got to learn this so we can do it Sunday at church. Count 'em. That's good. Um, there's a song that I just put on my iPod that. <clears throat> I heard on the radio, and uh, it's uh, called Walk With Jesus by Consumed by Fire, I think is the name. I don't even know the group. I just like the song. But the, the essence of it is there's a lot of people living for a lot of things. I'm just going to live for Jesus. And I just like it. I'm like, it's simple. It's what life's all about. Amen. Uh, mine is the Jesus Paid It All. Oh, that's good. That's my favorite. Amen. Yeah. I would say uh, I like, uh, <laughs> I've been liking, uh, David Crowder just put out one called Grave Robber, yeah, Grave Robber. and I, it's, it's a fun song. Yeah. So. Oh, I play in the worship band every now and then, and you go through seasons in the band where you play a song a lot. It's a good, by the way, you should play an instrument or uh, get into it because they get stuck in your head and then you're just singing them all day long. Uh, but one that I've been singing lately on our deputation as we've sold our home and embarked on a tumultuous journey is called uh, Trust in God. Oh, I think it's Elevation Worship. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. Oh, yeah. And he goes on to say, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. Yeah. And it's just been really meaningful to me that God is hearing my prayers. And uh, the song of my heart, it kind of changes based on the season that I'm in, but that one means a lot to me right now. Amen. Well, brother, you got the mic. So here's uh, here's the last one across the board. And thanks for that, guys. I, uh, I was up in. Bo I'll just share this real quick. I don't. I'm not supposed to get into this, but I was in Boston last year. At, I was kind of spying on another church, and I was so moved by the praise that it, some of the stuff, stuff, old songs they were rehashing. I can't remember off the top of my head, but man, I just amen what you're saying. Some of that stuff just gets in your heart, and I've been like singing them for six months, and I just. Uh, uh, one is, is uh, praise. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's a good, <laughs> praise God. No, uh, it's a good, there's a good song that I, I'd heard it before, but man, once I heard it uh, up there and in the context of Boston, it just rocked me. And I've been singing it and singing it and got on my playlist. It's just awesome. But you guys need encouragement in the Lord. I know that. And I didn't ask you to tell me what's negative. And all these guys could tell us a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, but let us uh, let us do this, and, and folks, as we're as we're listening to these, uh, really, I've taken some notes as they've been talking. But let's make sure we really listen up now, because they're gonna. I'm gonna ask you, what can we and how can we pray for you? What would you have us pray for you? Right? I mean, whatever. It doesn't have to be super spiritual for ministry. It could be personal. It could be ministerial. It could be, man, I need I need a thousand dollars to get home. I don't know. Whatever. How could you? How could? Yeah, we'll start with that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, a couple things. We have a prayer card that has some specific prayer requests on it. Go see that. If I'm just sharing my heart with you right now, I'm in a vulnerable place where I'm fundraising and uh, looking for partnerships and support. And that's uh, just difficult as a man. I'm called to provide for my family. And, you know, I'm not totally there yet all, on all of my funding, but we're still moving forward. And so I'm, I'm trusting God and singing that song that he's hearing and he's going to provide so uh, just pray that God provides the resources. And we got several churches lined up, and I know he's ahead of me. So that's just kind of a vulnerable one. But then also, I guess in terms of vulnerability, is uh, for spiritual warfare and what that means in the context of your family, uh, with your kids, and um, 
how kids process spiritual warfare. You know, they're not adults to fully understand the Bible and choose to walk with God, but yet uh, you bring them along with you in your battles. So if you just pray for my family, uh, my kids, my wife, my marriage, that would, that would mean really a lot to me. Uh, personally, uh, I got, you know, my daughter Josephine uh, has a bunch of health issues still. They're talking about replacing knees, and they've done two surgeries on that. Well, anyways, we've had to manipulate our lives a little bit here and change insurances, and St. Jude's is taking care of her. She's cancer-free. I want to rejoice and give God glory. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. Amen. Um, but, uh, you know, we just sat at the doctor's office in Chicago, and, you know, y your daughter's 19, We got a hard decision to make, like, uh, they're, they're talking about amputating her foot, and uh, that just kills you, you know, but we got to make some decisions. I, I want prayer for wisdom in that, and we, by, by God's grace, so we manipulated insurance, and we got a, a, into Mayo. We get, get to go to Mayo, and they're, they're going to really look instead of, when you're on state aid and doing all that business, they don't take care of you, you know, so anyways, personal but then for like the ministry and church, um, I'm all about the, uh, I'm 53 years old. I thought I would be much further in my life and in the ministry than I am. I'm not lying. I don't focus on that because it would lead me to depression. Um, God's disciplined me. He's pruned me. But what, what I really got out of that uh, here recently is, I want to end well. I, I, I want to learn how to abide. I, I don't want to focus on me producing fruit and all this stuff. I, I really want to end good. And brother, you don't know how much your, your story, um, Rick, has just touched me. And I love his kids are serving Jesus. This dude's after it. Mm -hmm. And he's older than me. And he's experienced probably more heartache than me because of maybe uh, longevity and just knowing that you love Jesus and you're walking with him and still want to sing songs to him. And uh, I, I would give my foot to end up like that. So just want you to so, well, pr pray that though. I want to abide, man. I want to go out strong and uh, I want to be with Jesus uh, tighter than I've ever been. I want to be the girl like King David at the end. That, that poor little girl gave her life knowing there would never be a piece of fruit there. Just said, would you keep the king warm? Mm. And she says, I will give my life to keep the king warm. I want to go down like that. Amen. Yeah, I may have so many needs, but all I can ask is for the wisdom and the grace as I continue where church planting is concerned. So pray for the wisdom and the grace upon my life and my family because we need the grace of God. It's not an easy thing. We know that ministry is not the matter of sugar and butter, but there are some hard stuff we are going to encounter. So we need this grace and the wisdom. Amen. Um, we're adding a, a pastor to our staff, an intern, in two weeks. And when I do a, a marriage and a, a premarital counseling, I will often talk to the couple. And I say this phrase a lot, you've never done this before. And in most cases, they haven't. Uh, marriage. Uh, but I've never done this before with having somebody working alongside where I'm responsible for them and and the pastors will understand this the bride of Christ is a sensitive thing and you can upset the cart and so there's just there's just some anxiousness um, so I would appreciate your prayers for us and then I have two weddings back-to-back -back weekends and it's a lot of work again pastors would understand that it, not this next weekend but the next two weekends and uh, it's not for the work I'm asking prayer for weddings are such a wonderful opportunity to present the gospel in a way that people have never seen it's not yelling at them about sin or hell it's really a demonstration of love 
you have a, this person loves this person and that's why they want to enter into this and that person loves this person and you can really display it and people see it in a whole different way so if you think about that mm. next couple weekends um not this weekend but the next two can have that opportunity and i just pray that the gospel would be really really clear i know there's unsaved folks coming um, i would start off with leaders that reproduce christ leaders that would own the mission i feel like every area in our church from the children's ministry to the youth ministry to disciplers to even the bible institute students that have graduated it's like we just need leaders that are going to own it and, and and get after the mission but um, the second thing is uh, i just found out about a month ago that my my sister-in-law who i don't have a relationship with um, I, I don't have much of a relationship with my, my brother but I found out she has stage four GI cancer. Mm. And um, there's actually, that this has been intense. There's a benefit this Saturday for them. And I asked Josie, Mike's daughter, I said, man, I'm not reaching out to this, this family like I should. I'm not close, there's, there's, they're not returning phone calls. and. Um, it's just, it's weird. I can sense some spiritual warfare. The real issue, and this is what I told our church, it's not that she needs healed from this. It's going to take a miracle, supernatural miracle, because they're giving her two months to two years, but her soul needs saved. Yeah. And I'm not sure where she's at. I was under the impression she's, she's unsaved. Um, I've heard some different things recently, but I'm just asking that you guys would pray for Angela. Angela's her name, and Josie uh, man, this was beautiful. She sent about a five minute video. She doesn't even know this girl. I explained this, this, the situation. I said, Josie, would you share your story and how the real miracle in your life was that God loved you enough to give you cancer and he restored your soul. He, he, he fixed your heart. Mm -hmm. And, and so she did, it was a beautiful little testimony. And I've sent that and I've not heard anything back yet. I don't know what's happening in the world. Um, but I'm just asking that you guys would pray for that God would rescue her soul and we'll take the, the physical too. I mean, that for sure, but mm -hmm. her soul's at stake, Angela. Well, I mentioned that uh, we're getting ready to plan another church there in Liberia, so certainly we could use prayer for that. And uh, really what we need in regard to that, and I think it's really either directly or indirectly, what all of us are asking is just for wisdom and direction. Um, you know, our, there's so much unknown in our ministries. Things are changing all the time. And... We just need divine wisdom and guidance and direction um, each and every day as, as things arise, as things disrupt what we think <laughs> our plan is. And um, we, we serve the God of all-knowing, and He knows before we even think of anything. And just pray that uh, He would guide us in, in, in the work we're called for. And I, I just wanted you to know I appreciate you men. And your faithfulness and and, and the struggles you're, you're going through and, and dealing with. And it's been a blessing for me this week, preacher. It really has. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's a blessing for me to be able to um, count you as uh, parallel partners and my friends. And, uh, and, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to you guys, um, you're just so transparent right in front of all these people. You know, you don't know all these folks. And, guys, this is what ministry is about. I mean, there's a lot going on. And so I just, I just want to encourage you guys. I want to do this. I want to pray over them, over these men. And uh, if you're a pastor here at HBF, I want you to come on up here. And I know I didn't prep you for that, but you don't need prepping. So uh, being sitting in season, out of season. So I see a few of you. And uh, come on up here. We're going to just have a quick season of prayer. And uh, we'll pray over these guys and HBF folks and, and our guests and all those that are watching. If you're watching online, uh, join us in, in praying. I asked you to account for each one of these prayer requests. So this is our test to see how well we did. And uh, we'll just have a brief season of prayer, and then uh, I, I need to transition to the next part of the service. But I just appreciate all you guys uh, personally, and I'm thankful for parallel partners, because guys, we, got, we need each other. I mean, more and more as we see the day approaching, we've got to have Philadelphian relationships. And um, I'm telling you, Laodicea is self-centered. 
and you can't get the ball where it needs to go that way. I mean, you can't advance the mission properly like that. You've got to have, I don't care how big your church gets or how small you feel like you are, you've got to have parallel partners. I get so much from every one of the men that come, uh, all the parallel partners that we have as a local New Testament church, and then also personally, and it really is an encouragement. Uh, it's faith to faith, and, uh, and you continue to go forward. So let's do this. Let's pray over these guys, and, uh, and we'll just, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll just kick it off, and we'll just go down the line. I don't need that. So, and, uh, and then we'll just be done. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time just to visit with these men, and just thank you for their heart. They're so transparent. Thank you for their, their willingness to just share their, their needs and their prayer requests and kind of where they're at in the little capsule. I want to pray for these men's wives and their families. Lord, I know uh, that's important to each and every one of them. And uh, as Thomas pointed out, uh, that's, a, that's a primary concern for him, uh, Lord. And, 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 and many of them are concerned about how they finish. Um, and they're concerned about how they finish others and how others that they're ministering to finish others. Uh, it's so, uh, so much about the Great Commission. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would provide and protect. I really love the, the, the image of Christ in the church or that picture. And uh, in a time when, when people don't know if, even what gender you've created them to be, Lord, we are stewarding the mystery of Christ in his church. And, and what an incredible opportunity we have in this culture to sanctify that and, and put that on the front and without apology and, and just highlight that. And Lord, what a beautiful thing for us to be contemplating tonight. Lord, just, Lord I just love you and I thank you. And Lord, in the midst of that, there's there's, uh, you know, the concern, the looming danger of death that is, uh, that is just so ever, uh, you know, present. Uh, not just physical death, Lord, but the, the, the greater issue, which is death because of sin. And Lord, uh, we are all gathered tonight. We're here, here for this conference because of this. And Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just grant the desires of each and one of these men's hearts as they're out planning churches, as they're as they're uh, doing ministry, as they're engaging in their families, as they're uh, bringing uh, couples together in unison as a family, as they are endeavoring to uh, bring the church uh, literally home across the finish line faithfully and sanctified. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing on them tonight in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, I want to just thank you for these men spending uh, time with us this week and coming and sharing their life with us. And Lord, I just, uh, I just pray that you would give them the wisdom that they need and the discernment they need in the ministries that they have. I pray for Bo that you'd give him uh, opportunities to speak to his uh, sister-in-law. And we pray for her soul, Lord. We pray that she would come to know you as Lord and Savior, Lord. And I pray for Jay as he, as he uh, is uh, marrying a couple people in the next few weeks, Lord. Just give him the words to say, which we know you will, uh, to get the gospel to the people that come so they would hear that the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just want to pray for the rest of them. I pray specifically for Thomas too, as, as he's on the road, he's, he's got a, uh, a plan to get a church going in Portland, Lord, and taking his wife and his kids clear across the country to a place he doesn't know. And Lord, I pray for the people that are going with them, as well as him and his family, that you just put a hedge of protection around them. I pray that uh, you would get them there safely. They'd get the word of God out. People would get saved and people would get discipled. And Lord, I just pray that uh, pe key people would be raised up in their ministry to work with them and help them uh, plant a church in Portland. So pray for that, Lord. And again, I pray for each one of these pastors and missionaries, Lord, that, that they, they desire to, to finish well at the judgment seat of Christ. They they desire to, to finish well. They desire their, their families to finish well. And they desire the people they minister with to finish well. And Lord, I just pray that they would see fruit in their ministries. And I pray that when they get to the judgment seat of Christ, they'll hear that well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Father, we can continue in prayer. It's, it's such an honor to be standing here with these men, Lord. It reminds me of... The fact that David had a band of mighty men. And these men, these pastors, these missionaries represent a band of mighty men who are trying to lead uh, a flock in different locations around this country and around this world to accomplish a great thing, which is to declare the love of God through Jesus Christ for the world. I pray, Father, that you would protect each one of them, that you would give them the, their desire, the desires of their hearts as they gave us 
prayer needs uh, just a short time ago, Lord. And, and Lord, you heard those. You knew, you knew what they were before they said them. I pray, Father, that you would honor their prayers, their requests, and Lord, and you would meet those needs. And that, Lord, that you would uh, just continue to guide and direct them, help them to be the leaders that they are in their churches and in their ministries. Help them to be able to encourage other men, other women uh, to step forward, to sacrifice their, their, their secular life, that they might have a spiritual life with you. I pray, Father, you give them the strength to accomplish these great things and that you would continue to protect them and their families and their church. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, our gracious creator and our king, Lord, we praise you for how you have uh, shown yourself in these men and you've uh, fed us through them uh, this week, Lord. We, we thank you for that. And Father, we, we know that the day is coming soon uh, when your judgment, your wrath is poured out. Or that, that's clear all throughout Scripture, but until that day, grace. And I pray that you would uh, carry these men with your grace, that they can extend it, that they can extend your love, that it would pour out from your word into their hearts and then um, out of their mouths and out of their hands and feet, Lord, that, that um, they would show forth the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that they would truly would abide with you. Lord, that you would um, pull them close and the body that, that you are building through and around them. Lord, that you would strengthen them, that they would be shepherds who are feeding the flock. Lord, I pray that you would keep them far from uh, wickedness and sin. Lord, uh, that you would put that at bay. Uh, that you would accomplish great things through them. Lord, that they would, they would be fueled by faith. They would be fueled by love. Lord, I pray for their families, Lord, that um, it, it is a sacrifice to be in the ministry. And these men who have extended their lives but for your grace, and uh, Lord, we do pray for their families because we know it's on their, their hearts, whether it be their immediate family or extended family, Lord, uh, we, we know that's a sacrifice in the ministry because Satan is, is at the attack. Uh, Lord, we thank you for these men, and uh, we, we do thank you for, as was shared last night, the love of God that's poured out. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, let it be um, overflowing in their lives that others would see it and they would feel your love. But for the grace of God, go I. Because of your grace, we're saved. Because of your grace, we are accepted in the beloved. And your grace sustains us. Your grace empowers us. And so my prayer is very simple and very short. I pray, Father in heaven, that your grace would just be poured out upon these gentlemen, upon their families, and that this grace that is poured out on them, Father, I pray that you would use them as channels of grace to those that they are trying to reach, those they are trying to minister to, Lord, those they are trying to be examples, those they are trying to lead and disciple. And so, Father in heaven, we look to you and we trust in your all-powerful grace upon the lives of these men. And your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, who is the epitome of grace, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. Can you put that over there, please? All right. Yeah, if you could go ahead and grab one, that would be great. Those guys are after him, but they'll... Yeah. Go ahead and pull them off to the side. That will be good. Thank you. So as we continue to talk about parallel partners, um, I want to introduce to you another parallel partner. Many of you have already met, and uh, if you were here on Tuesday, um, man, Andy Summers brought it, and he, he taught on stewardship, and man, it, I tell you, I walked out of here, I went, first thing I did is went and talked to Amy, I'm like, man, I needed to hear that. And so Andy's been a great, great blessing to our church this week, but before that, I met Andy 
through the Wounded Spirits Ministry. Another talk about another parallel partner. That's Doug Carriger. Many of you know Doug Carriger, and we partner with him for the Wounded Spirits uh, PTSD Ministry, uh, which is primarily focused on those that have had uh, trauma through military uh, or um, other type of traumas, such as uh, um, EMS workers and law enforcement things like that. Uh, and Doug has done a tremendous job. And on the road to, uh, you know, you'll remember many years ago um, when Doug was here, uh, his journey kind of changed as he was introduced to Stephanie Wesco, and it took a whole other direction, and, and Wounded Spirits really expanded. And part of that expansion was bringing on Andy Summers, who, um, who oversees the finance and leadership. And so I'd like to invite Andy up tonight just to share some of the ministry, and so give him some love as he comes tonight to speak to us. Thanks, Andy. No, you need a mic. The people online can't hear me. They cannot. All right, now everybody can hear me, including if there's anybody watching online. So really the reason I'm here is to show you a picture of my family. That's my claim to fame. It's my wife, Mickey, up there. She was here uh, Sunday, and uh, she uh, dresses me nicely. She coordinates my tie with her dress, as you can see, things like that. The important things in life, right? My daughter, Abigail, she's 14. This is about a two-year-old picture now. And uh, she absolutely loves horses, and, uh, and so she does that every week. And, you know, it's crazy. We were in Indiana and then Maryland a couple years, and now in Denver, Colorado, on the east side in Aurora. But she started learning English writing, and out in Colorado, they don't do a lot of English, mostly Western, right? So it took us a while. We found her a barn. Uh, Nathan is my 18-year-old. He's studying computer programming, and he actually just fell in love with his first love. A 1999 Camaro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? He bought his first car. It's a 99 Camaro, five on the floor. It's a six cylinder. It's not the super sport, okay? So, but uh, that's his first love. So I don't know if your first love was a car too, but it is his. So, well, I'm here uh, to tell you if we go to that next slide, this is why I'm here. How did we get involved with Wounded Spirits? Why well, I, I shared earlier, I won't repeat all of it, but the Lord uh, took me through a, a journey of accounting and business degree in college, studied missions in seminary uh, down in uh, South, Af South America, I'm sorry, in South Africa is where I did my uh, seminary internship, uh, been to Brazil a couple of times as well, and uh, different parts of the world. But I actually have also been a youth pastor, was the administrative pastor of a church and a school, and I actually, while I was planting a church, uh, actually, there was a, a friend of mine who was uh, Stephanie's husband, okay? Charles Wesco, you can go to that next picture and you can see right here's a picture of Charles. And the last time I saw him alive was in July of 2018. I actually met him in the 80s. My church stopped doing the Awana program and the midweek services. So I went across town and I went to Awana with him. He's a little bit, just a year or two younger than me. And I got to know him, but later uh, we were attending the same church in the early 2000s when I got married. I have a picture of Stephanie with their firstborn back to back with Nathan you just saw there in their bellies. And uh, Charles was one of these guys, he went around and tuned pianos. Uh, if you ever heard of Walter Pianos, his grandpa was Charles Walter who made Walter Pianos in Elkhart, Indiana. And so he was a piano tuner and he would call me just on his way between tunings and he'd be, hey Andy, what? Do you think that there's angels locked up today? You know, I'm reading Jude last night. I'm just like, can you ask me something like, you know, what about the Nephilim? I'm like, okay, hold on, wait, you know. So he would be driving, and he'd call me, and just whatever the most obscure question he was thinking of that week, he would throw it out at me, you know, and, and uh, we would have some great discussions back and forth. But he went to Cameroon in 2018 with Stephanie, who's been here, and uh, it was, was, and their eight children, and Charles, of course, then, was on the way into town on the 10th day there, and someone walked up to their car with a shotgun and shot him twice in the head. He was sitting in the front passenger seat. A missionary was driving him to town. Stephanie was sitting right behind him, and Charles Jr., their second oldest, was caddy corner. The amazing thing about that is you think about shotgun shells and all those pellets going everywhere, none of the rest of them got hit with a single pellet. It even blew out the window over Charles Jr.'s head, catty corner. You can imagine the trauma that Stephanie, right there, reaching forward, holding him up as he's shot in the head twice with a shotgun. 
and there's no ambulance to take you to the hospital. They went across town in the bumpy roads. They were still outside of town and got him to the hospital, and, and he passed away. He was evacuated. Uh, Samaritan Purse helped to evacuate them back to the United States. As you can imagine, Stephanie went into a great amount of PTSD. The next slide is a picture of someone you know, Doug. And uh, Doug was introduced to them through a mutual friend who actually took over the piano tuning business for Charles, and he still tunes pianos today. He was on our board for a while, and uh, he's taken other responsibilities, so he's, uh, he's a great friend of the ministry, but he's off of the board at this time. But Doug uh, counseled with Stephanie, helped her to move from not even being able to get out of bed all the way to the point where she's ministering to others. But the question is, okay, so what is PTSD? P Post traumatic stress disorder is a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed traumatic events. So it doesn't have to be military. It doesn't have to just be police. There's many other people that experience it. In fact, so here's some statistics on it. The National Center for PTSD says that 60% of men and 50% of women will experience at least one trauma in their lives that may or may not lead to PTSD. Listen, PTSD can happen to anyone. And PTSD is not a sign of weakness. But currently, post-COVID, their estimates are saying that about 20% of our current population is currently suffering from PTSD. That's one of five. Look around the room and you think about the idea of how many are in here. Statistically, that'd mean one in five in here are currently suffering from PTSD. But let me tell you this right now, PTSD is not about anything that's wrong with you. PTSD is about what happened to you. And that's a very strong distinction we need to understand. So often we think about something is wrong with me because I was involved in whatever it is, a car accident, you were in the military, whatever. But it's not something that's wrong with you. It's a response to things that happen to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Wounded Spirits does, though. And in 2023, we saw 1,200, through our missionaries and partners, 1,200 professions of faith. Amen? Uh, we, we were able to train through, not directly, but we have these church partners and our missionaries, 5,000 people with biblical answers for PTSD. We were also able to place 20,000 Bibles in the hands of our military heroes, specifically on bases, and establish a daily connection with thousands through our daily podcast and radio broadcast. On the next slide, you can see it's Help for Wounded Spirits. You can look for that on the podcast. And if you look at the, the corner here, a screenshot from yesterday, we've had over 123,000 downloads. There's uh, over a thousand episodes you can listen to on all kinds of topics going back many years. And uh, that also, there's, there's radio stations that have picked that up and actually are using these and broadcasting them over the radio waves in different parts of the country and actually in different parts of the world. Uh, this last year, uh, Doug's material was actually translated for those in Ukraine. And there are many churches in Ukraine. Uh, Doug's had phone calls with people over there, pastors, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, a chaplain or the head chaplain in the Ukrainian military uh, there. He also took a trip to Australia and saw many people saved there. There's a number of churches there that are now using his material as well. He's in, been invited to go back this year for, to Australia. And so he's asked a couple of churches to help. Those plane tickets aren't, you know, like from here to Denver, you can get them pretty cheap, right? Here to Australia, it doesn't happen that way. Um, but our missionaries worked on four continents and six countries in 2023. That's just what our missionaries did. That's not the indirect work as well. In fact, in February this year, we established contact with seven new groups who are now using the Wounded Spirits Ministries. In just one month, their curriculum, in just one month, we're able to expand it that much. It's amazing how much God is doing right now. And we have a new missionary who's currently on deputation to work with a church plant out in Colorado Springs. All right, I'm in Colorado, so I'm cheering for that. And there's a lot of military people specifically they're going to focus on. And Doug actually has been able to schedule two additional meetings in the coming months that are specifically tailored to reach out to veterans in the community. Those are usually near bases and things like that. Most importantly, though, we bore witness to the Lord's saving, transforming, and healing power in countless lives. This is what Wounded Spirits does. This is what Wounded Spirits is about. I, I said that wrong. This is what God does. But this is what Wounded Spirits is about. But you say, okay, so what do you do? I'm not a PTSD counselor. So what do the Summers do? What does Andy Summers do? 
Well, there's a list here I can tell, tell you a little bit. I complete the business functions of the ministry, and I can tell you any pastor, anybody that's leading a ministry who's got a good business guy, and I'm not saying I'm a great business guy, I know how to do it, and I do my best at it, but you got somebody managing that part of it, it takes a big load off of you, just like it does for your pastor. So I take, I have a lot of experience with, between church planning, other mission agencies, and other roles I've had. I process the funds when they're received. Uh, I conduct board meetings. I'm currently the board chairman, pay the bills, distribute funds to the missionaries, which is very important. At least they think it is, right? Uh, it's very important to be distributing those funds to the missionaries so they can continue to do the work of the Lord that God has called them to do. And you say, well, what can we do to help your ministry and help the summers? Well, you can do this specifically. Pray for those who we are helping. Prayer changes things. Pray for the missionaries that are actually out there meeting with people. Pray for the, these, these groups of people, like you have a group here that can meet with people and counsel people. Listen to those that are hurting around you and love them in Christ and give as the Lord leads you. Uh, that's really the three things that we ask for is just prayer. Pay attention around you because when we say one in five, I guarantee you there's somebody in here that's probably dealing with a traumatic event in their life, whether it's recent or a long time ago, that's affecting them. I'm going to give you a quick summary of my passion for this ministry. You know how I got involved through my connection with Charles Wesco. But let me just share you, this is a question that I ask myself, is why do bad things happen to good people? If you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 4, uh, the first answer, of course, is sin. But... Notice what the Bible says here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Mercies, amen. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I want to emphasize those two things but who comforteth us in all of our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth in Christ. And if you ask me, if I was up here on the panel, what is your life verse? I'd be pointing to this right here. Uh, we all have times of uncertainty in our lives. But I'm going to tell you that my God, your God, our God is in control. You know, nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing forces God to a backup plan. In fact, let me tell you this. God doesn't have a backup plan. There is no plan B because God is in charge and he never it has a time when he's not. Nothing can shake the purpose of heaven not even the greatest king of the past, the present, or the future. Listen, our response to circumstances of life is determined by the way we view God. And others understand our view of God by our response to the circumstances of our life. In his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer said this, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When circumstances of life do not go as we expect them or want them, we so often question God instead of our own expectations. We assume that there is something wrong with God instead of something wrong with ourselves. I'm guilty of that. I don't know about you. We ask God why he let something happen as if God could not have prevented it or as if he was not paying attention, we begin to think of God as a human, as us, and not omnipotent, not omniscient, all-knowing, not omnipresent everywhere at all times. But verse 2 says, grace be to you, for by God's grace are ye saved, right? Amen? There's some other aspects of grace, and here's your sermon outline for Sunday, brother. Listen, God's three points God's sovereign grace. God's grace can overcome everything. There's nothing that God's grace cannot overcome. Amen? And God's sustaining grace. God's grace not only saves us, 
but sanctifies us and takes us home to heaven one day. And third, God's sufficient grace. Now, I live in Colorado, right? So there's this uh, mountains out there, right? When I think of going up over the mountain, man, I don't know about you, but I like to top those mountains at full speed, man. I want to crest that hill at 55, right? And I drove school bus for a while, and we had a church bus. Anybody ever heard drive a two-speed rear axle straight truck vehicle? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. You got the little switch on the wheel. You got two low and high on the back and four on the, four on the shifter on this. And I was driving to a national youth conference with that, and the youth pastor that was co-driving it with me just could not get over the hill. And we were only in Tennessee of all hills, right? They weren't that big. But, you know, when God says his grace is sufficient, you might only be going over the hill at two miles an hour, but he guarantees you you're going to get over it. God's grace will never leave you short of cresting that hill. You know, you will always have his grace will always be sufficient. Notice what he says in verse, the, in that verse, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a quote from John Phillips first. He's a commenta uh, commentator. Grace and peace are the two elements in the chemistry of God's love, which combine in the human heart to produce true and lasting happiness. But what is the source of our comfort? Okay, we have grace. Now we have comfort. Verse 3, God the Father is the source of our comfort. The Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort. But then we get to the real point as I wrap it up here of why I'm so passionate about this is the purpose of our comfort. Why? Notice what it says in verse 4, that we may be able, that we may be capable of. Here's a purpose for you, right? Why does God allow it at all to him, or to happen? Why? So that we'll run to him. So that we might turn to him. That we might in turn be able to comfort others, as the verse says. What is the purpose of our comfort that God gives us? To comfort and to encourage, to strengthen them which are in any trouble, that are oppressed, that are distressed, that are in any way having a problem in their own lives. Romans 5, 5 says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad. How? In our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. How is the love of God spread abroad? Through us. It is spread abroad in our hearts. Listen, do you need God's comfort? I know there's many times I do, most of the time, are you keeping the comfort to yourself that God gives you? Or are you willing to be a, com a conduit of God's comfort to others? That's what this verse says. You can be a conduit to others. 2 Corinthians 2, 4 says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulations. Why? No, look at that again. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Maybe the purpose of what you're going through, the difficulty that you've been through in your life, is because God, God wants you to be able to comfort someone else going through the same thing. Listen, your pastor hasn't been through everything you've been through and can only have an overflow from his experiences. This church needs every one of you because every one of us has different experiences that then we can reach others. Each and every one of us is called to this. This isn't a, a call to the pastors. The purpose of Wounded Spirits Ministries is to reach those suffering from PTSD with the love of God, with the gospel message, and the comfort that only God can provide, and to comfort others with the comfort that they have themselves received. Are you willing to be that conduit? You know, we ask why so often, don't we? I'm going to tell you this as I close just about this ministry. I, I have this friend Charles that was like no other man. I could talk to him about any extreme biblical, and there was no question, any verse in the Bible, man, he would debate it with you, have fun with it. I mean, you name it, any topic, you know, and uh, all the time. He was a great encourager in the faith. And God chose to take him home. And I struggled with that for a while. But then I started to get some reports. There was a missionary that went and did language school, went to Central America, learned Spanish, was living out in a remote area in Central America, and he'd been there for several years trying to lead the locals to Christ. After Charles died, 
Civil war was breaking out in Cameroon. And literally hundreds of Cameroonian refugees fled to Central America and began to walk toward the United States. Here was a missionary who went to remote central, remote villages, Central America, and all of a sudden, God is sending him English-speaking Cameroons. They walk into his camp and he says, do you know who Charles Wesco is? And he's like, well, you're from America. You should know who he is. He's like, I don't know who he is. So he started Googling, found out who he was, called and, and uh, actually talked to Stephanie's dad. Next thing you know, he's leading by the dozen at a time to the Lord, Cameroonian, English-speaking Cameroonians who are now in Central America, and you never know how God's going to work. Last I heard, there was close to 100 Cameroonians that he led to the Lord in Central America, where he took language school to try to lead people to the Lord in Spanish, and he's leading to the Lord there. Many people have committed their life to missions because of that. Sometimes we find purpose in it, and sometimes we don't. But let me tell you, this verse and this ministry is about exactly this. Whatever you've been through, there's other people that you can be the conduit of God's love and God's comfort and pass it on to them. And that's my passion. That's the passion of our ministry. And I'm so thankful for, brother, for your pastor, Brian, being part of the board. And I'm so thankful for this ministry that's seeing so many come to know Christ and find healing through his word. Thank you for your time today. We were able to have uh, Brother Andy out this, this, uh, this week, and it's been good to get to know him and hear from him. And, uh, and again, I, as you, I, think, I don't know how many at HBF know this, but we've endeavored to do this ministry here, and I'm still praying uh, for leadership and some things that we need in regard to execute it properly. Uh, but there's a need right here where we live uh, to, to continue the, the ministry of wounded spirits. So pray with me for that. And I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to ask that, uh, you know, we've been preparing for la since last week to take up an offering right now. We're going to give back. If you're a member of HBF, this isn't, if you're a guest, man, just relax. Uh, we're going to watch the video, watch the video. If you're a member of HBF, we've been praying about giving back to the Lord this week as God lays it on your heart over and above your regular gifts just to help uh, continue to advance, uh, you know, this mission and this mission conference. And uh, any over and above that we get will go right to the missionaries uh, as well. So, if, uh, if you'd prepare your hearts and, and, uh, and the, the, the ushers will prepare the plates and we're going to give back to the Lord. So let's pray over the offering and then we're going to, uh, we're going to watch a video from Brian Berry uh, before we hear a couple more of our living history folks come. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this presentation that we've just heard from Andy. And we do want to lift up Andy Summers and his family as they <clears throat> continue to help advance the mission of, and the ministry of Wounded Spirits and Doug Carriger and, and all the many uh, statistics that he laid out there. Lord, there's a tremendous impact and a tremendous need. And it's a great opportunity to meet people with the gospel as they're suffering from a trauma and, they're, and, they're, and their brains are literally rewiring themselves to handle some of the situations they face. Lord, uh, the gospel is an amazing uh, medicine. It's the, it is the only thing or that really matters in this life is, is knowing Jesus Christ and his power of the resurrection, being saved and born again. And we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that. We're thankful for all the ministries and missionaries that we've heard from this week. And uh, Lord, just the hearts that we've been, been, uh, been exposed to for your mission, Lord. And we understand uh, that with you, there's nothing impossible. And Lord, you call us to, to do things that seem impossible or maybe doesn't, don't even seem logical. As Andy just mentioned, I mean, why would you take Charles Wesco? And then, uh, you know, only time reveals how you'll use that in the lives of the Cameroonians and in the lives even of his family members and, 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 and even his testimony and so on and so forth. Lord, you, you do those things uh, for the benefit of the kingdom of God. And, and Lord, you're greater than death. Lord, death has, has no more sting. And so, Father, we're just so thankful for that. And as we come back today and we give back to you, Lord, we pray, God, you bless it and multiply it uh, for the ministry and that you'd use it for your honor and glory. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the play goes by, just uh, focus your attention on Brian Berry as he has a few words for us this week. 
Hello, Pastor Hedges and Heartland Baptist Fellowship. It does not seem possible that it has already been a year since Vision Conference of last year. Um, it was such an honor to get to be there uh, with you all. My name is Brian Barry, by the way. If you don't know me, I'm your missionary to Ireland, and hello from Ireland. Um, but it's just crazy to think that it's another year, another Vision Conference, and uh, it was truly a, an honor for me to be part of your last two Vision Conferences in person, and I'm thankful that I get to send you this video from Ireland just giving you an update on the ministry here and to talk about your investment and helping me purchase the field of Ireland. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being invested in helping the gospel be spread throughout Ireland. Um, I would not be able to be here in Ireland if it wasn't for churches like HBF. And um, you guys know I love your church very much. You were very dear to me. And so thank you so much for that partnership. But I just want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in Ireland and how you can pray for me specifically. And let me start off by just giving you an update on the visa. Um, that's kind of like the big elephant in the room everywhere I go. How's your visa going? How's your visa going? And, and I get it. It's a process I've been working through for almost a year now to get this visa to move here. The good news is that I've been in contact with my lawyer here in Ireland, sending paperwork back and forth. And I would send her paperwork, she would look over it, send it back telling me there needed to be revisions or that she needed different things. And finally, every single document that she needs, she has, and she is completely satisfied that when we submit this, it will be approved by the government. And what's exciting is that as of an hour and 45 minutes ago, uh, well, not when you're seeing this, but when I'm recording this, that paperwork has been submitted. And so now it's just a praying time and a waiting time. Um, all the paperwork is good. She was very encouraged that my paperwork is stronger than anybody's that they've ever helped. And so that is great because I'm only in Ireland right now temporarily. I'm here on a six month tourist visa and I'm kind of handicapped on the things that I can help them with. Um, there's ministries to be started and, and I'm going to be taking over the kids ministry and the youth ministry. But I can't do that yet because I'm not able to be vetted by the local police to have a background check because I'm just here as a tourist. And so while there's currently things I'm able to help with in the ministry, ultimately I, I can't be fully effective doing what God called me to do until I have the visa because then I can be here f you know, full time permanently, not having to worry about restrictions on what I can and can't do. And so praise God that the visa is submitted and now we just wait. Um, I have to come back to the States in June to speak at a youth camp. And the go the plan and the hope is that when I leave, it'll be approved so that when I can come back um, at the beginning of August, I'll be able to be here for good and to stay. Over the last uh, month and a half that I've been here so far, I have traveled all over this country, and I was already burdened for Ireland, and if you've talked to me, you know that I have a great burden for Ireland. But as you drive throughout this country, you see so many fields that are white unto harvest, but there's no laborers that are here to harvest them. Um, you know, we can purchase, I can try to purchase the field, but I need workers here in the field with me because it's too much work to do by myself. And what I'm excited about is that there's a complicated situation with my visa to where for the first year at least, I have to live three hours away from the church that I'm actually going to be doing ministry with on the weekends. And another church is helping sponsor me to get into the country. And I have to have an official role with that church. And so the plan is for me to start a Bible study in the town that I'll be living. It's a town called Fermoy, and that town is about mm, seven to 8,000 people has never in their history had a gospel preaching church. And so the plan is for me to start a Bible study in town with the hopes of growing it and eventually establishing that Bible study as an independent local church. And what's exciting is that the prospect of planning a church, I thought, was five years down the road. Um, part of the reason that I'm partnering with the Boyne Valley Baptist Church that you've heard so much about is because it seemed like there was no way for me to be involved in helping plant a church other than work with somebody for five years and then go out on my own and start a church. But through this other church that's helping sponsoring me, 
I will be able to start a Bible study, be involved in being on the ground floor of starting a church in a town where there's been no gospel influence ever. And I am so excited about that. It's just so exciting because... Everything I'm doing with Moyne Valley Baptist Church is still happening. Um, all the guitar lessons, all the youth discipleship, all the children's ministry, all of those things. But in addition to that, I get to be involved in helping with this new Bible study and eventually with this new church plant. And so there's just ministry after ministry after ministry. But as I drive between Fermoy to Drogheda, where the Boyne Valley Baptist Church is at, your heart just breaks because you go through town after town after town with no gospel presence. And so I'm thankful for the investment of HBF financially in my ministry and prayerfully in my ministry. But I'm so excited once I'm able to be here permanently full time that I can give you guys a call and say, hey, I need help. I need people to come over to help with a vacation Bible school. I need you to come over to help with a conference or, or with children's ministry or with discipleship, all these different things. Because there is so much ministry to do in Ireland. And I'm excited about it, but when I stop and think about it, it kind of is overwhelming at times. Um, but I'm thankful, number one, to know that I'm not alone because I have churches like yours, but also I'm not alone because it's God who's called me to do this. It's God who will provide the increase, and I'm just going to be accountable for my faithfulness. And so things are going well here in Ireland. Life and I've learned government paperwork is much slower here in Ireland. Um, but I'm just so excited that I get to be a part of this and that we get to be a part of this together. And so I would ask that you continue to pray for me, pray for Ireland, pray for the ministry. And um, I will be back this summer. You might see me at some point in person. I'm trying to just come back really quickly to the States so I can get back here and get to work doing what you're supporting me to do. But I'm excited for your vision conference. Like I said, it's been one of the highlights and honors of my ministry to get to be there with you all and to see your heart for missions. And I'm thankful that I've got to experience that firsthand by your love and your support for me. So thank you for what you're doing. I'm excited to be following along online. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm thankful that I'm here in Ireland serving God and it's because of you. And so thank you. I will talk to you later. I'm just rambling at this point, but you guys are the best. Have a great vision conference and I will talk to you all later. Amy Beatrice Carmichael was born December 16th, 1867. Accepting the Lord at the tender age of 13, Amy grew in her passion and understanding of God's will for her life. Attending a Keswick convention in 1887 at the age of 20, she heard Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China, speak of the mission field and the need for laborers in the field. It was while attending the convention that Amy felt a strong call from her Lord to become a laborer in the mission field. Amy Carmichael spent a brief time in Japan as a missionary, but she would ultimately be led by God to settle and minister in southern India. Arriving in southern India, southern India in November of 1895, she labored for her Lord for the rest of her life to never return to her, her ancestral home in Ireland. Even though she would often place herself in peril, Due to the anger of the local Hindus who would shout threats against her, Amy devoted her life to ministering to rescued temple children who were given to a temple as a religious offering by their parents to serve the temple deity. The way of love is never an easy way. If our hearts be set on walking in that way, we must be prepared to suffer. It was the way the master went. Should not the servant tread it still? It is possible that we may find ourselves enclosed in circumstances which drain natural love till we be as dry as grass on an Indian hillside under a burning sun. We have toiled for someone dear to us, but never knew it as toil. We have poured out stores of health never to be recovered and did not know it, nor would we have cared if we had known it, 
so dearly did we love. And all our hopes was that the one so cherished would become a minister to others. But it was not so. And then, unwillingly, we became aware of a strange unresponsiveness in the one for whom nothing had seemed too much to do, of a coldness that chilled, a hardness as with hard hands pushed away that heart that had almost broken to save that life from destruction. And then, though only those who have gone through such a bereft hour will understand, the love, the years, slips from us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is that fading from our memory? Love never faileth. Is love failing now? Shall we find ourselves meeting lovelessness with lovelessness? In such an hour, a poem, now many years old, that expressed a desperate prayer burned into words. Deep unto deep, O Lord, crieth in me, gathering strength I come, Lord, unto thee. Jesus of Calvary, smitten for me, ask what thou wilt, but give love to me. Yes, ask what thou wilt, but let not love depart. Nothing ordinary is equal to this new call. Nothing in me suffices for this. O Lord of love and Lord of pain, abound in me in love. Love through me, love of God. At the age of 64 in 1931, Amy Carmichael had a serious fall that damaged her spinal cord that kept her an invalid for the rest of her life. Yet in spite of great pain, she continued to write and disciple leaders, missionaries, and Indians to take her place and continue the work. Once when asked by a young woman what missionary life was like, Amy responded, missionary life is simply a chance to die. Having faithfully served the Lord for 63 years, Amy Carmichael at the age of 83 died in India in 1951 at Donavar, India. Her headstone is inscribed with a my, revered mother, which the children of Donavar called Amy Carmichael. William Carey, known as the father of modern missions, was born August 17, 1761, in the county of Northamptonshire in the hamlet of Purry End, England. In 1775, at the age of 14, William Carey was apprenticed by his father to learn the trade of a shoemaker in the nearby village of Pennington. William Carey was blessed with a bright and inquisitive mind, as well as being gifted in languages. Studying on his own by the age of 21, William Carey could speak Dutch, French, and Hebrew, and would later master Greek and Latin. On October 5, 1783, at the age of 21, William Carey was baptized into the Baptist Church and denomination and began preaching immediately, mostly on the theme of missions. William Carey would often preach on the topics of Christian obligation to spread the gospel to all the peoples, the prudent use of available resources for missions, and obtaining accurate information about mission fields to be reached. William Carey was instrumental in the organizing of the English Baptist Missionary Society was one of its first missionaries to India along with a man named Dr. John Thomas. His services in India were remarkable for their range and depth. In addition to soul winning, Carey founded the Siriampur Sir College and with the aid of other linguists, the tr uh, he translated the Bible into 44 languages and dialects for the Indian people. A Christian minister is a person who in a peculiar sense not his own. He is the servant of God 
and therefore ought to be wholly devoted to him. By entering on that sacred office, he solemnly undertakes to be actively engaged as much as possible in the Lord's work, not to choose his own pleasure or employment or pursue the ministry as a something that is to subserve his own ends or interests or as a kind of bywork. He engages to go where God pleases and to do or endure as he sees fit to command or call him to in exercise of his function. He virtually bids farewell to friends, pleasures and comforts, and stands in readiness to endure the greatest sufferings for the work of his Lord and Master. Here he established the Serium Poor Mission Press in which special fonts were cast in order to make available the Bible to 300 million people in their heart language before the American Civil War. William Carey was also instrumental in developing grammars and dictionaries in Bengali, Sanskrit, and other native tongues. William Carey spent 41 years in India without a furlough. While reclining on his couch, revising his Bengali Bible, William Carey died on June 9, 1834. Impressed with those uh, living history characters, and uh, praise the Lord. And, and as our next speaker comes, uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, he is one of our uh, most probably potent and parallel partners. He's my friend going way back all the way to uh, my first uh, days in the Lord and our work together here in Kansas City at our own missions and our own neighborhoods and so on and so forth. You guys know this story. It's so good to have Doug home with us today. He's going to bring this conference home as he comes to preach. Come and preach to us, Doug. It's good to have you. Give him a good HBF welcome. Love you. Love you, too. Love you Pastor Brian. Okay. Now, as they say in India, Jay Masiki. Praise the Messiah, Jay Masiki. You know, I just flew in from India last Wednesday night. I came in to, from India. And, uh, and I'm so excited I can be back at this conference. And this is really, you know, this is my family. This is my home church. And, and I, I'm one of you. I, maybe one unique thing I can bring tonight, I'm going to bring something a little bit different than you're used to on a typical, you know, Bible preaching conference. I'm going to bring a testimony. I'm going to bring you some life tonight. But one unique thing I can bring to you tonight is I am one of you. I was here in the beginning of this church, when this church was just a Bible study in someone's house here in Harrisonville back in the year 2001, back in the year 2002, I, I came here. And Pastor Brian Hedges and I, we used to work together at the City Union Mission and, uh, through our, our Baptist Temple ministry up in the city, right? And uh, I, had, I had a bachelor pad. I used to, you know, own a house, and I was a single guy forever. I was like bachelor to the rapture. And, you know... I used to have a, a house, and two of the guys that Brian Hedges discipled, guys that came out of the City Union Mission, they were homeless, they went through discipleship, and they got established, and they moved into my house after they, they were discipled by Pastor Brian, you know? And that was the same time that he was starting this church in Harrisonville, and all through that transition time, that, that whole time that I was preparing, going through our shepherd school, our HBI training that we have now, um, I had it in my heart, God, I know you're calling me to overseas ministry, and India was always in my heart. But before I got a chance to go to India, I did one missions trip to Zambia, you know? And I, one of our, our brothers here from Zambia this week, we got, heard a lot of word from our missionaries to Zambia, missionaries to Liberia, missionaries to Sierra Leone. And this church has a real connection to Africa. And I'm so on fire to meet them again because when I went to Zambia, Africa in the year 2000 to work with Bobby Bonner and, and all the African pastors there, you know, I suddenly really, it was my first time out of America. You ever, you guys ever been out of America? <laughs> and your first time out of America, it's like, oh my gosh, like I've been living in a little bubble my whole life thinking America is it, you know, and where it's like, the whole world is out there just waiting for us. And we're so distracted by details of life, aren't we? Our little American lives, right? 
and Satan has that bubble working. That, Satan is like a spider weaving a spider's web of all the details of your American life, you know, to get you trapped, you know, where you can never take a missions trip. And I have several fresh ideas for you tonight, and I want to recruit a lot of y'all tonight to uh, get involved in missions, not only abroad, but doing things here in Cass County. And uh, I want to start with this scripture. Now, before I get into some of my pictures, because I, I have some great pictures to show you of some testimonies, but I want to start with the Word of God, because let's bring the priority where it is. The Word of God should speak first. And it's in John chapter 20, okay? So if you have your Bible, it's, it's not going to be up on the screen. Just open your Bible. It's not going to be on the screen. In John chapter 20, I want to provoke us, first of all, before I get into the mission's testimony. <clears throat> because when you talk about the Great Commission, that's what we're talking about in this vision conference. Every year we have this conference in April, and it's about the same thing over and over again. And we have the Great Commission in five books of the Bible, five scriptures in the Bible, the Great Commission is given from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. And we, I think we've memorized them all, right? Except, I think there's one, I think you are a little bit, maybe, everyone, there's one of them that we're kind of weak on. Like we know it, but we don't really know it. Because everyone knows Matthew 28, amen? Like we know that we're supposed to go into every nation and we're supposed to teach, we're supposed to disciple, we're supposed to baptize, and we're supposed to bring people to maturity. And that's an amazing, that's a strategic, Jesus knew what he was doing. Boom, boom, boom. There's the Great Commission. And then again in, in the end of the book of Mark. Now, and Mark's a quick book, right? Mark's like reading a fast story. And Mark, in the end of the book of Mark, Jesus says, and now go, go into every nation and preach my gospel, right? I mean, it's just a very quick Great Commission at the end of Mark, right? Go into all the world and preach my gospel. Jesus finishes the Great Commission. And then the book of Luke he opens up their minds to understand the word of God. Like the, those guys are on the road to Emmaus and then suddenly they understand the word of God and then it says all the disciples are gathered together and for the first time they understand the scriptures and he, he opens up their minds. Because you know, those, you know those 12 disciples that Jesus had? Jesus had his own HBI, right? It was, it was his heart Bible Institute, amen? Like here we have the Heartland Bible Institute but Jesus had his heart Bible Institute. I mean, he just gave his, he poured out his heart into his, how many students did he have? Twelve students. And of course there were several other students that would gather along as well. And for three years he taught them line upon line, scripture upon scripture, and he lived with them and he, he breathed with them and they did ministry together. But you know what? After three years they still didn't get it, did they? They were still failing their exams. Huh? The 12 disciples, at the end of three years, they're getting ready to graduate, and then Jesus goes to the cross, and they all run away. Peter denies he even knows them. Happy graduation, you know, right? Like, what a graduation for Jesus. I mean, what, what kind of a teacher is Jesus Christ? Like, his students all failed. But they didn't fail in the ultimate sense, because they failed, but they came back. Except for Judas. Judas didn't come back, but the rest of them, they came back, amen? And... When they came back, they saw Jesus resurrected. And in Luke 24, Jesus gives the Great Commission. He opens up their mind. It's, it's Luke 24, verse 45 through 47, 48. He says, he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And he says, now forgiveness in my name will be preached in my name to every nation. Repentance and forgiveness will be preached in my name to every nation. Right? Right? And he says, and you are my witnesses in verse 48. That's Luke 24, 45, 46, 47, 48. So we know those scriptures really good. And then again, he repeats it one more time. Like he's getting ready to ascend back up to heaven. And they're like, Jesus, you know, you, you met with us for 40 days after you rose from the dead. We had a 40-day Bible school. That's my favorite kind of Bible college, a 40-day Bible college. We do that in Arissa. See, Pastor Brian and some, Jeff Trude and some of you guys came over, and you gave us a 14-day Bible college, and then two men came over and continued it. That's how you all used to do it, is you used to send two men to our Bible college in Orissa, a bunch of Orissa village pastors who've been persecuted, and they're learning the Bible from 9 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. They take a lunch, 
from 1 to 2, then 2.30, they're back at class. They want to learn from 2.30 to 6, they want to learn the Bible again, right? And Brian was there, had like, you had to teach all day long, and did your voice do okay that, that time? It's like you had to have a lot of water. And then they said to you, they said, hey, Pastor, thank you. You're teaching us every single day for like eight, nine hours a day, but we want to take you to a village that's never heard of Jesus one hour here. From away from here, and they took you, and they took. They said, "Let's show you how we do it, right?" And that's what it's like when you go overseas and you do an overseas mission. You teach and you teach and you pour out, but then you find out you learn more from them than they're that you're teaching them. You learn more from them, amen. So this is how it happened. Jesus is about to raise up, back up to ascend up to heaven. He spent a forty-day Bible college with his disciples as a resurrected Lord, right? And then Jesus gives the Great Commission once again, as if they haven't already heard the Great Commission like four times already, right? He says, and you shall be my witnesses in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, and you are my witnesses, right? And he says, okay, bye-bye, you know. Don't go. Are you going to restore? Hey, Jesus, we haven't quite learned dispensationalism yet. Paul hasn't come yet. So... Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel again? Like, we don't get it. It's like, <laughs> if Jesus could just say, hey, listen, I'm going to convert Paul soon. And <laughs> Paul's going to give you the book of Ephesians and Romans and just wait. But, but here's, okay, I'm getting to the point, right? Here's the great commission that you all are the weakest at, and I'm the weakest at, and every Christian is the weakest at this. It's John chapter 20. And what does it say? This is the great commission. John chapter 20 and verse 21. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Amen? Man, that's a loaded statement. I mean, I could just stop right there and preach. Every pastor ought to preach on that one verse for an entire Sunday morning. Man, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is something even women can do, amen? Women discipleship, right? Men and women together, we can be full of the Holy Spirit, we can be full of Jesus Christ and say, you know something? Jesus, I was a no good sinner, but you left your throne and your riches and all of your glory in heaven, you left it. You left your Father. You left every, all the angels in heaven and all the wonderful things there. And you were born and dirt with the animals, with the llamas and the alpacas and these strange animals spitting everywhere. And you, Jesus, was born on dirty, dirty planet Earth with horrible people surrounding you, children getting killed everywhere, um, you know, all kinds of evil everywhere, right? And Jesus said, I volunteer, I will leave my place of blessing. I will leave my place of position. I will humble myself and I will become a servant. Philippians chapter 2, right? He goes, hey, listen, it, it, this is nothing. I, I don't need everyone to uh, give me glory because I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to show you what real glory is. I'm just going to become a nobody. I don't need to be a somebody. I'm going to become a nobody. I'm going to become a floor mat for people to walk over me and I'm going to let them crucify me just like a rose crampled on the ground. He took the fall and he thought of me, right? He became nothing. He became a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So now God has highly exalted him and given the name above which every name, which is Jesus Christ. That every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because he did that. Now, this is where we're weak, right? We know how to do discipleship. But not like this. It's like, I, I call it incarnational discipleship. And that was my burning ambition as I went to India. I had like a secret ambition, you know? You guys ever had like certain ambitions in your life? Like, I just really have this strong desire. I want to accomplish this. I'm a, I have an ambition. I said to myself, when I go to India, I've been praying for India I've been, you know, I've been ministering alongside Pastor Brian Hedges. I was involved in the junior high ministry with Bruce Metter when Bruce Metter's kids were junior high kids. And I was, in, I was 
you know, to become like junior high kids, I used to be a junior high kid, you know, like to become like those, to reach those kids. I used to do youth ministry work, homeless ministry work, evangelism, all kinds of ministry. I discipled people, and I said to myself, all my life I have wanted to go and live amongst people and just be, among, like, be Jesus to them. You know what I'm saying? Like Jesus said, I want to go to the earth and just love people, rescue people, die for people, save people, teach people. I want to live amongst them, right? So I was still single. I, hadn't, I had not yet met Bethany yet. Like Randy Foster was praying that I would meet Bethany, but she didn't come yet. So I was still single. And by the way, Jesus did not wait to get married before his mission, amen? Jesus went single, amen? And he stayed single. <laughs> and, and Jesus was willing to die to meet his bride. And I died to myself, and I stayed committed to the mission. And then one day, I met my bride, you know, and then she did come to the mission field. And we met each other in the mission field. So um, I said to myself, Jesus, your great commission, I know how to do discipleship. I can teach all nations, I can baptize, I can teach all the discipleship lessons. But can I say, Lord, just like you sent Jesus to go live amongst the filth and just live with the people, right? Just be a carpenter for 30 years, right? And just hang out with the people and question them, you know? Like he, Jesus used to question the leaders about their false doctrines, you know? And then the time, the time came where Jesus was ready to teach, right? And he waited for his ministry to start. And he began to have a powerful impact in his ministry. But why? Because Jesus was a man of the people. Jesus was a man. He was a common man. The book of Isaiah gives a prophecy. It says, the appearance of Jesus' face will not be beautiful. Amen? He will not stand out in the crowd as someone shockingly, stunningly, you're like, oh, we got to follow that guy. No, he was a common man. Nobody knew that this was the Messiah. So that's the, that's the great commission for you all today. I'm challenging you that in your life, you should start having an, an ambition that I want to identify with lost people. There's a group of people that you're going to reach, but you have to go where they are. You have to go hang out where they are. You know, maybe it's teenage. Maybe you want to work with youth, and you have to go hang out with youth to reach them, you know? Maybe it's drug addicts. Maybe it's people who are just strung out, and they're just really hooked on all kinds of drugs. But you have to go where they go. You have to hang out where they hang out. And you have to protect yourself at the same time that you don't get tempted in the same way. You have to go be with the people. You have to go into the inner cities of play. You have to go to the square of Harrisonville and hang out every day, right? Because the square of Harrisonville is coming back with these new restaurants, right? It's like you got to hang out with the Harrisonville, you know, the, the common people, you know. So that's the great, now two more scriptures before I get into the pictures, two more scriptures that are tied up with this principle of letting Jesus send you just like the father sent him to go live amongst the people. Amen. First uh, John 4, 17, this is not going to be up in the screen. You have to look this up. First John 4, 17, it's the same principle. Okay, here it is. 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So you, a lot of you still have not taken that boldness yet. You've been through discipleship one. You've been through discipleship two. But you've not yet taken this mentality that just like Jesus was in this world, I am in this world in the same way I am just like Jesus Christ. Amen? Now that goes along with the principle of Romans chapter 8. Now Romans chapter 8 says, For all things work together for good to those who are the called, who are those who, are, who love God and who are the called according to the purpose of Jesus Christ. And Romans 8.29 says, For those he has foreknown, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. What does that say? Romans 8.29 saying, As soon as you decided, there was your free will to decide to receive Jesus, God fixed your destiny. 
right? You got saved. It was your choice. You said, Jesus, I trust you. Holy Spirit came. He sealed you. And he fixed your destiny. You can never lose it. It's a predetermined destiny. And what is that destiny? Not just to make it to heaven. No. Your destiny is to be conformed to what? The image of his son. You're to be just like Jesus Christ. And this is what's wrong with discipleship today. Amen? We're discipling people, but they're not becoming like Jesus. You understand what I'm talking about? They're becoming like some, they got personality problems and they got emotional problems. They've been through discipleship and you look at the character that they have and they know all the Bible knowledge of discipleship, but their life is nothing like Jesus Christ. Amen? What is wrong with discipleship? Now, it's not going on much in this church, but every church has the same problem. You got people who've been through discipleship, but they're nothing like Jesus Christ. Repent. Repent of your discipleship that is not like Jesus Christ. If you have a personality problem, give it to the Lord and say, Lord, I want your personality. What kind of character did you have? The love and the mercy and the patience and the holiness and the purity and the, the stability in your life, Jesus, give it to me. Because I cannot be me. I, it's no longer me. It's Christ living in me. That's discipleship. So that's what... First John is saying, he said, as Christ was in the world, so we're just like Jesus in the world. Romans 8, be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. And so as soon as I showed up to India, I'll quickly move through some pictures and we'll go back to some scriptures after that. See, these pictures I have, me and Bethany here, uh, met together in India. And as soon as Bethany showed up, they said, hey, listen, hey, Bethany loves the people more than you do. They said, Pastor Doug, they always call me Pastor Douglas, you know. Pastor Douglas, Bethany loves people more than you do. Like, thank God you married that lady, you know. <laughs> so, uh, let's go to the next picture. Now, uh, yeah, so the next picture is like Pastor Ganesh. So, so he's the first guy. So this is what happened. I decided when I got to Bombay, India, there's 20 million people, and there was an Indian pastor that asked me to be his assistant pastor. Did you all know that that's one of the secrets of missions? Is you start praying for national pastors, Indians and Zambians and Africans, and you pray for a missionary that's there, and you say, hey, listen, I'm just a nobody. I'm just a junior high worker, you know. I'm just a homeless ministry worker. But hey, can I come help you? And they say, yeah, right? They all want help, right? And so an Indian pastor said, come over and be my assistant. So I got to the church, and it was a rich church. They had lots of money, and they were not reaching the poor. Because everywhere they, you look in Bombay, there's these high-rise apartments, and there's slums. Half the city is a slum. People living with no toilets, no running water. They're just in squalor. And the rich people, they say, hey, listen, they're reincarnated like that. They deserve it. And I'm, re I'm reincarnated rich. I deserve this. Right? So I had to start teaching the Christians to think differently. They say, hey, we, you know, we're Christians, but we don't mix with those people. Oh, really? <laughs> and I met Ganesh. Now, you guys know Ganesh. Ganesh is one of those people, one of the untouchables. So he came to the rich church, and he was the only untouchable in the rich church. Amen? So I said, hey, listen, I'm going to take Ganesh, and we're going to go reach these slums. And they said, go for it. And I got some of the rich Christians to go with me and to, and to, reincar to, to, reincar to be like Jesus, to, to incarnate, not to reincarnate, but to incarnate, amen? <laughs> because Jesus incarnated into the earth, amen? But this, this was the problem. Ganesh was an evangelist, right? Ganesh was the Billy Graham of India before I ever met him. But he didn't have any disciples, right? He didn't have any long-lasting fruit. He just won people to Christ. Okay, I'll see you in heaven, right? So I trained Ganesh how to be a pastor. You know, I mean, I watched, I watched Brian, how he pastor. I said, let's do it like Pastor Brian does. Let's disciple people, you know? And of course, Pastor Brian brought over discipleship to the church, and Randy and, and David Pierce was on that trip. And so we took Ganesh, and we, started, we planted three churches in the slums, and we have disciples upon disciples. But I want to give this report. I'm always, sus I suspect something's wrong when a missionary gives us a report. He says, you know, I've planted five churches and we have 500, you know, we have 1,000 people. No. Hey, listen, we planted three churches in the slums. Each church had about 30 or 40 people. 
And that was about 10 years ago. Guess what happened in the last 10 years? Those first 30 people that we got saved and they became the Lord, only 10 of them are still with us. And 20 of them backslid. But guess what? We got 20 new fresh ones to come in. And we led 20 more people to Christ. And out of those 20 new people that came to Christ, only five of them have stuck with us. Amen? And so we've gone from a church of 30 all the way to 70 now. But if everybody came to our church at once that we led to Christ, we'd have like 500 people, but they're all backslidden, you know? And I don't know if it's my fault or their fault. I mean, I hope it's like, I hope I didn't do a bad job discipling them. I mean, we're trying to disciple people, but they drop out. Does that happen to you? Did people drop out? Do you feel bad about that? Like, oh, I failed. No, you didn't fail, right? You're trying your best. And you should expect failure, amen? Jesus expected the failure of his 12 disciples. Jesus wasn't surprised, was he? Jesus said, hey, it's written in Zechariah, smite the shepherd and the sheep will what? Scatter. He knew it was going to happen, right? So you should expect failure. But after failure, what should you expect? Restoration, amen? Amen, a restoration. I love the restoration part. You know, I love when I don't see somebody for five years in church and then they come back and if they repent, if they're repenting, amen. So that's, that's Pastor Ganesh. So the, the, before I get to the next picture, the update is we've trained an assistant pastor. We have two assistant pastors and we're about ready to hand our three slum churches over to our assistant pastors, Pastor Manish. And Ganesh has it in his heart. There's a tribal group outside the city and they're like, they're called an unreached tribal group. They've never heard of Jesus. It's called the Korku tribe. So he said, oh, Pastor Douglas, before I die, I have to reach the Korku people. I said, Ganesh, I'm going to help you. As, it, before I die, I'm going to help you make it happen by the Lord's grace. And so we've taken three missions trips to the tribal area, and we've made our initial contacts, you know. Like we've made the contacts and now we're, we're, I'm going back to India. This next month I'll be back in India. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the Korku people with this Ganesh, with Pastor Ganesh. And we're going to reach, you know, village upon village upon village. We're going to show the Jesus film. We're just going to evangelize and try to make a few disciples and then start a new church. And the good news is right next to this tribal group that we're going to reach this, this next year, 2024, 2025, Right next to this tribal group who've never heard of Jesus, there's three Baptist churches who don't evangelize at all. There's three Baptist churches that were started by missionaries a hundred years ago. And some of the old, you know, you go to those churches and all the gray-haired people say, you know, oh, we've been faithful in this church for 55 years. And I remember the missionaries were here. And they taught us how to sing the old hymns. I'm like, praise the Lord, you guys have been faithful a long time. Who are you reaching? And they're like, well, if we reached people, they might get angry. And, uh, you know, that tribal group there, they haven't heard of Jesus, but, you know, they're Hindu and we're Christian and that's the way it's supposed to be. Like, you didn't read all the Bible yet, right? <laughs> like, whatever Baptist missionary led you to Christ forgot a couple of chapters there. Because here they're, they've been Christians for 100 years and now they're going to church. Why? Because my father was a Christian. And my grandfather was a Christian because my grandfather was led to Christ by the missionaries, right? And now I'm a Christian, and most of them are true Christians. They have good doctrine, but they have no burden for all the lost people around them. So guess what Pastor Ganesh is going to do when he shows up to that Baptist church? And guess what I'm going to do when I show up to that Baptist church? Like, we, actually, we already did it. We preached in that Baptist church uh, last November, so pray for us that we can bring revival to the Baptist church. You ever met a dead Baptist church? <laughs> hey, every Baptist church needs revival, amen? And y'all can help us with this. I'm trying to recruit trips to India in 2025, okay? 2025, I want you to come over and help us to reach the Korku people and to bring revival to some Baptist churches and then also do some training to some, some of our Bible students there. Next picture. So the second person God gave me, oh, this is, that's our assistant pastor. We're going to hand over the slum churches to Pastor Manish. And we helped arrange, we actually did an arranged marriage because Pastor Manish is Ganesh's assistant. Now, you might have seen him before, right? Now, this is his wife, Gudia, with Bethany there. So Pastor Manish, you know what happens in India? 
arranged marriages. And you, you guys should try it here in America. Amen? <laughs> because every father and mother take care of their kids. And the father and mother plan. They, they, they go, father and mother search the whole place to look for a good boy or a good girl for their child, right? And they make sure they have good, you know, marks in their education and they have good looks or whatever it is. And then they put the, the boy and girl together and they say, hey, it's a match. But you know what happens? When they come to church in India, they say, hey, my parents want to arrange a marriage for me, but they're Hindus and they're going to give me a lost spouse and I don't want that. So pastor, you have to arrange the marriage for me. Like, you're my spiritual father. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> right? I, I've never done this before. <laughs> so I just, I just got, got on the telephone, and we have different churches that we work with in that part of India. And I said, hey, I've got a boy. Do you got a girl? You know? <laughs> like, so, now the girl, number one, the girl has to be through discipleship. She has to take some, Bi has she took in Bible classes? Has she got a call in her life? Does she know that the guy's a pastor, that she's going to be a pastor's wife? Ask her what she thinks, right? And of course, very quickly, we found this beautiful young woman, Gudia. And I had to meet, as soon as they met each other, right? They, 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 they knew for, they, they kind of told, they told me, they said, I like that person, you know? I said, but, I said, be careful. I said, let's not make it a match until you make a friendship first. I said, you have to go for coffee. You have to call each other, text each other, and make a friendship for two months, I give you two months, and come back in two months and tell me, are they, are they at least friend material, you know? Because I said, your wife or your husband should be your best what? Your best friend. So after two months, they said, I can't live without this person. This person's an amazing person. I, I love this person, right? They both fell in love with each other. In two, that's all it takes is two months, amen? <laughs> I don't know why people are... People are boyfriend and girlfriend for five years and they still haven't got the ring on the finger. What's happening with people? <laughs> so Manish is going to take over the slum churches and be the leader while Pastor Ganesh and I go to the Korku tribe and, and Sindhu and Bethany travel with us. Let's go to the next picture. So then we have Pastor Ganesh. That, that's, some of the Kork, that's the Korku tribe. It's a Christian school. So as we went to the Korku tribe, there was... Pentecostals were the only people reaching the Korku people, and they started a Christian school, and their Pentec guess what? I don't care if the leader of this school is a Pentecostal, he's my brother, he's my new best friend. He's a principal who's teaching Korku Hindu kids about Jesus, and maybe he has a little bit wrong doctrine, but hey, I can work with him, amen? I can be his friend and help him understand that, hey, we, we have the same Bible, let's get in, in unison about some good doctrine. I'll teach them some doctrine, you know. And I believe that we're going to use this Christian school as a ground for a new church because the Pentecostal doesn't really, he's not planning a church. He's just, he's just doing education, right? So that's one contact that God gave to us. These children are still lost. They're, a lot, they're not really saved yet. Next picture. Okay, then God gave me another disciple named Pastor Bishu, and this is in Darjeeling on the border of Nepal, it looks like Nepal because of all the mountains and the, that city that's on top of the mountain. So we're gonna, I'm going to help this guy. His name is Pastor Bishu. And he lives in Bombay and he has a lot of disciples who are ready to all move back to these mountain villages. And we're going to start Darjeeling Church. And, this, this, and then as soon as we start this church, we met five other churches in the, these mountains they're not affiliated with anybody. They're not Baptist, Pentecostal. They're just, they're just non-denominational. They don't know what they believe. They don't know the Bible. They love Jesus. And they said, can you give us Bible classes, Bible college, Bible institute? And so we're going to open up a new Bible college because why? That entire part of India and in Nepal border has no Bible college. They have churches, but no training. So we're going to open up a Bible college, and we want to invite you all to come teach your HBI material to a bunch of people through, trans through the Nepali translation to these hills and tribes who we're going to start a new church and a new Bible college for all the churches. So that's Pastor Bishu. Next, next picture. And then God gave me Pastor Pradeep. So Pastor Pradeep has the microphone there. You all know him very well. I'm praying over, these are the new graduates of our, our Bible college in Orissa. This is the villages of Orissa. 
and Pastor Brian and y'all come and help me teach this group. But this is a new batch of students that you haven't met because you guys have not been to Arissa since before COVID. So this is the new batch that we're graduating and they're being sent out to the new villages. And by the way, if, if you guys are connected to Pastor Pradeep on Facebook, you might have got a message of what exactly happened last week that, that one of, it was actually, let's see here. The, sec, the second one, the one that I have my hand on, okay, I have my left hand on this young man. His name is uh, Saguna. So Saguna is our disciple, and he goes to a village every Tuesday night. And in the village that he goes to, it's called Sikar Pai, right? And you saw what happened if you got the, you guys got the picture on Facebook this week that the key a convert to Christ in the Sikar Pai village was, was, his house was destroyed, they stole his animals, and he was beaten. And Pastor Pradeep had to show up and help to stitch his head back together. So the persecution in that part of Orissa is very serious. And when I come there, and when Pastor Brian comes there, Pastor Pradeep never takes us to those persecuted areas. He knows that we might draw too much attention to that persecuted area, right? So, but he sends his disciples there, and they end up getting beaten. So, it's happening on a regular basis. So, that's Pastor Pradeep in Arissa. And so, there's, there's so many more, more people in Arissa State that need to be reached that you all can help us to further that vision because the, the work is not finished in Arissa, India. Because what happens is that we, we reach them in Bombay. I'm based in Bombay, but when they are from Orissa, we send them back to where they're from. And we train them in Bombay, send them back to Orissa, and then they start churches all over Orissa. Next picture. Is that, it goes, it goes to the video next, right? Okay, so before the video comes, um, I want to just finish with this one thing that um, Bethany and I got a chance to go on a special trip where we learned something special about the Bible. I had this deep desire in my heart as I was living as a missionary. Um, and I'm going to close with this. I'm going to, we're, we're going to skip, there's going to be one video I'll tell you where skip, but I want to show you a couple of videos. And this is something that God told, taught me fresh as I've been living overseas and tra coming, coming to America, going back overseas, that God gave me a chance, like one special chance to have a special trip. I've always had this desire and to use it today for, as a teaching tool today, that you, you can see that the Bible's so real, that I always wanted to walk where the Apostle Paul walked, you know? Like, I also want to walk where Jesus walked too, right? But I always wanted to go where the Apostle Paul started all those churches, and then, how, you know, I wanted to see uh, the results of that, right? So, we, my wife and I, during, it was during COVID time. You know what we did? During COVID time, we decided to take a cruise, amen? <laughs> and Bethany got online, and she, Bethany was so suffering during, she was so tired during COVID, she said, she said, I, I need a vacation, right? I said, but the vacation has to have a purpose. So I said, if you get online, find cheap. She found $400 tickets on a 10-day cruise. Imagine that. 10 days on a cruise for $400. And... So she said, it starts in Rome and it finishes in Athens, right? So we got to see Rome and Athens, and we got to see Ephesus where Paul started the Ephesians church. And, and I'm taking all this in and I'm saying, hey, listen, what I'm experiencing in India is the same thing that Paul experienced when he was amongst the pagans of Europe, right? But Paul saw it took 300 years for Europe to become Christian, and I keep encouraging our Indian Christians. I, I say, hey, listen, you're going to be persecuted for 300 years. Don't expect that all these blessings are going to come. There's no Christian prosperity. There's Christian persecution. And the same thing's going to happen to America, amen? There's going to be 300 years of persecution. Uh, no, I'm no prophet, right? I don't know what's going to happen to America. But I know one thing. You should expect more persecution and less freedom as a Christian in the coming years. I really expect, now, I expect some of the worst things are going to happen, but I'm still, I'm still a positive guy, right? I believe that we're going to take hell, and we're going to shake hell, and we're going to take new ground, and we're going to go on the offense. We're not going to be on the defense. We're going to go on the offense, amen? And so this first 
video. I'm going to show a couple of videos to just show you what I learned from walking in the steps of the Apostle Paul. So let's show that first one. Our guides have told us that the Greek culture has blessed the world with many things. One of those is democracy. Democracy was first uh, thought of and conceived here in the Greek culture and the Hellenization of the Greek times. Uh, one more thing that the Greek culture brought us is Pericles. So this Pericles lived in the time of Socrates and he conceived of a way to uh, rule the world through peaceful trade with no violence. And Pericles set up trade stations in North Africa, the Middle East, all over Southern Europe. And the Greeks began to dominate the world, not through bloodshed, not through armies, but through peaceful trade. And then after that tradition of peacefulness, the Greeks also brought us the Olympics. And the Greeks love sports. Many of the other neighbors around Greece love sports. And so they knew that people were fighting, nations were killing one another. And so they thought, let's make an Olympic game, sporting games, and we'll stop all the wars and cause people to have a competition with no blood but just running and throwing javelin and discus. And that tradition has continued even today. It's brought back into society in 1896. They started the Olympics again in 1896 here in Greece, in Athens. And it's a great encouragement to people to stop the fighting and to get involved in worldwide sports to relate to other nations in peace. These are things that the Greek people have given us. They've given us the New Testament. We have the, the New Testament is written in the Greek language. The Greek people have given us the message of Christ because the, after the Jews, the Greeks were the next ones that received Christ. So there's so many things the Greeks have given us. Now, I bring this up for a purpose that the Greek people were the first people group to really receive Christ after the Apostle Paul died and that first generation died. It was the Greeks who became, they were pagans. They worshipped Athena there. They worshipped Apollo there. And the Apostle Paul planted the gospel. And then look what happened. They all became Christians. Amen. I believe that's what's going to happen in India. You know, that's what's going to happen all over the world. People are going to come to Christ. Amen. But in my next one, I went just a little bit down from this hill where this, this uh, uh, temple is. And I, I saw this place called Mars Hill. You ever heard of Mars Hill? Right? So then I'm, I'm starting to preach on Mars Hill. And right at the end of this video, a lady stops me. And there's a woman sharing the gospel with gospel tracts. And she tries to lead me to Christ. All right? All right let's, let's see. The, that should be the next video, right? Oh, can, okay, can you do, you, do you see the one where it says the Mars Hill? Do you see that one? Okay, so we're standing now at Mars Hill. There we go. And we just finished looking at the Acropolis, but then we remember the Apostle Paul came here in Acts chapter 17, he met the Athenians. The children of Socrates and Plato were here discussing philosophy, and Paul wanted to give the teaching of Jesus, and they listened to him. When the Apostle Paul came here to Mars Hill and spoke to the children of Socrates and Plato, Socrates had taught them the possibility that there may be some God. He didn't know for sure, he was a questioner. Socrates would ask questions but never had the answer. So Socrates says, make a temple for an unknown God. There's some God, we don't know him. Make a temple to an unknown God. And the Apostle Paul found that temple to an unknown God and he says, I am here to declare to you who God is. The God that you are worshiping in ignorance, you don't know who God is, but Jesus Christ has come to reveal that God. Jesus Christ is that God coming to become a man. And Jesus preached forgiveness of sins and love, the love of God for all peoples, repentance and turning to God. Jesus Christ taught that the Spirit of God has always been with men through all history, giving us life and breath, waiting for us to turn back to him in grace. So Acts chapter 17 gives that sermon of the Apostle Paul and it's written right before me, Acts chapter 17 in the Greek language. So the Apostle Paul even quoted a Greek poet that in him, in God, we have our being, we, we have our breath. 
but we don't give credit to God. And so God is waiting for us to say thank you. How can we be saved? Through faith, through grace. We're born again when we say thank you, Jesus. You, what you did for me, you died for me, you rose for me. I receive your free gift of eternal life. And the Apostle Paul preached here. It changed many people's lives. The first Greek believer in this city and of Athens, Dionysius, and they named the street after him. So no one can deny it, it's in history. And we met a wonderful lady here, a friend of ours who's been sharing the gospel. What's your name? Dina, Constantina. Here it is. You can uh, say yes. to people. Acts 17. Act 17. You can go ahead and pause it. So I'll just say real quick. That's Dina. And she told me, for 20 years, I've been coming to Mars Hill and preaching Jesus Christ as a, as a single woman evangelist. And she said, where are the men? I don't know why men don't want to come and preach Jesus Christ. She said, the Apostle Paul preached Jesus right here, and I'm doing it today. And she said, look at my gospel track. She had Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, 40 languages, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she said, are you, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. She said, but have you been born again? Because many people think they're a Christian and they've never been born again. I go, oh my gosh. <laughs> Let me, I wish I was lost so that you could lead me to Christ. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so think, when you think of the Greek people, think right now, think of Dina. She's still there. And take a trip to go see this Mars Hill and she'll try to lead you to Christ. She'll still be there. Um, so very quick, I want to apologize to the people in the sound booth. Very quickly, I want to move to, um, I think the last video I had was on the Bema seat. Do you guys see the, and I went to the city of Corinth. We, we went to Ephesians. I saw the same stadium where they had the riot against the Apostle Paul. And you stand on the, sa the seats and the same platform has been preserved. And they said, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they tried to kill the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19. And I stood on that same spot where God saved Paul's life. And then from Ephesians, we saw that church. We went to the Corinth church. Now, do you see in the AV booth the one about the Bema seat? Let's watch that one. This is the exact spot where the Bema seat exists in Corinth. Okay, so this is the Bema seat that the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so in ancient Corinth, there was a courthouse. There was a place where the judge and the ruler would judge cases. And everyone had to appear before the Bema seat and they would be judged. And uh, the Apostle Paul saw that as an illustration of at the end of time when we all go to heaven, when the church is meeting Jesus Christ and we're there, uh, we'll receive our rewards. That Jesus has taken our sin, so we're not judged for our sin because Jesus took the judgment for our sin. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, when you build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones, those things will be tested by fire. And those things like wood, hay, and stubble, the things that don't have eternal meaning, some things in our life will burn up with wasted time. But the gold, silver, and precious stones are the people, the word of God, and the souls of people that you've loved and invested. Uh, Jesus Christ, love into other people will last forever. That's gold. So that gold, silver, and precious stones, those are the eternal things that last from our, our lives as a Christian. And the, the fire of God will test the works of all Christians to see if it lasts as an eternal work something that was done through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of God. Uh, God does things in our lives and there's rewards for that. Of course, when we get the rewards at the Bema seat, when we face Jesus face to face and we receive the rewards, we'll, we'll cast those rewards back down at his feet. We'll cast those rewards. An ultimate act of worship to cast your rewards that Jesus gave you back at the feet of Jesus at the Bema seat judgment of Christ and so we uh, we know that this finishes the church age and on into the the millennial age the kingdom the kingdom of God 
for all of eternity throughout the universe will begin. All right, let's, let's go ahead and pause the video now. And I, what I want to do today is just close. I want to close this in prayer because I, I have a few more videos and pictures I'll show you another time. But we got to see the, the very jail where the Apostle Paul wrote 2 Timothy, for I have run the good race, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course. And in that very same jail, you can go down into that dungeon and sit where the Apostle Paul sat in Rome. And you can touch the Colosseum that's been 2,000 years old Colosseum where they killed the Christians. And you can say, we Christians have the victory because all through the suffering of the church, we have seen the message of Jesus change every culture. And today we're hoping it'll still change America. Is there still hope for America? Or is America just going to become another Roman Empire? Right? Is America going to become another Babylon? Amen? So you have a chance to change this generation. You have a chance to take a missions trip. And I want to challenge you today that that message I just gave from the, I stood at the very same Bema seat that you have in the Bible, right? Which is saying, you're going to stand before God and there's going to be wood, hay, and stubble of details of your life that are going to burn up. And some of the things in your life are going to have no meaning. But some of the things in your life are going to be gold, they're going to be silver, and they're going to be precious stones, which are the people, the word of God, that you've devoted your life to pour your heart into changing people through the Holy Spirit, through love, through the word of God. And these things are going to last. Everything you do here with your Bible publishing is going to be gold, silver, and precious stones as you ship it all over the world. And so let's rejoice today because we have so many missionaries gathered, but let's be challenged because I want to warn you, each one of us is going to have to face God one day and we're going to have to answer for all of the wasted time that we used where we wasted that time and we did not get involved in the mission. And I want to challenge you that this next year, I want you to sign up for a missions trip. I want you to sign up for a ministry in this church. I want you to be involved, be enthusiastic. And some of you, I want, to cons I want you to consider this. Some of you need to sell your house and move to the mission field full time. Amen. Some of you, you could retire and move to Mexico. Amen. Some of you, you know, all the African missionaries that we have, we met Sierra Leone this week in Liberia and we met Zambia. Every single one of the African missionaries would love it if you would come for six months. Amen. And you know what you could do? You know, as a church, one thing you could do, a fresh idea is this. This has to come from the congregation, not from just anybody. The people in the congregation have to think, I want to give money so that we can be involved in missions. Now, what about this? Some people can never go on a mission trip because they can't afford the airplane ticket. What if people gave above their tithe and they gave to a fund in this church saying, I want to pay for someone else to go on a missions trip, amen? I want to give for the airplane ticket because we have, how many graduates do we have from HBI, amen? I'm thinking of guys like Ron and guys like Ray Blowers and Ron back there in the AV booth. We, we would love to see Ron and Ray Blowers come to India, amen? We would love to see Ron and Ray Blowers and guys like that go to Zambia, amen? And what would they do? If people saw Ron preaching the gospel in Zambia or India, that would change their life, amen? But maybe Ron can't afford the airplane ticket. So as a church, let's put together a fund where we're going to give monthly and weekly and weekly and then give $5, $10. And at the end of the year, there's a scholarship for HBI students and HBI graduates like Ron to go on a missions trip. Amen. And you can help each other do missionary journeys. And you can send Ron for six months. Amen. Ron, you want to go not just for two weeks, but you could go for six months, Ron. So you could... You could do mission trips for, for Zambia. Who wants to go to Zambia? Who wants to? I want to go to Sierra Leone when I saw that guy's video yesterday, man. I want to go to Liberia after I heard the testimony yesterday. But you know what? You all can go. If you would quit getting focused in the details of life, give up your house, sell your car. You got two cars. Why do you got two cars? Sell that second car, amen? And go on a mission trip. Uh, if you quit your job, Guess what? If you sell your house and quit your job, come back after a year. You can get another job and get another house. Amen? And there, there ought to be some people in this church who open up their basement for missionaries, just like, who was it that woman that opened her house for Elijah? Amen? Like, people in this church can say, 
hey, if anybody from Heartland Baptist wants to be a missionary, but they're, they're not sure how long they can go, right? They go for six months. I'm going to open up my basement. My basement's free. So when they come back from the mission field, they can stay for free in my basement. And I want to help them financially to be a missionary. Isn't that like outside the box thinking? Amen. Like these are things that you guys have to talk about as a congregation. You can help each other do missions trips and you can help youth. Now, how many teenagers have it in their mind in this church that when they graduate high school, they want to take a three month missions trip for summer, right? They don't want to go to summer camp. They want to go to Zambia for three months. Amen. Of course, they would want to go with a chaperone, amen? Like they're only 18 years old. But they, if they can find an adult that's willing to sponsor an 18-year-old kid, a 20-year-old tw- kid in this church that wants to go to Zambia for three months, we can find you a sponsor who's willing to be responsible for you, amen? If you're, if you're not t- too much of a troublemaker, amen? <laughs> so there are things that you all can do as a church that are outside the box, and you can start thinking, how can we send our young people uh, to the mission field, amen? And how many young people are dreaming about a secret ambition, about wanting to have a great job and a great house in America? No, all of our young people over here, you should have an ambition to go live overseas, amen? Why don't you go live in Zambia for a year and be a man, amen? Why don't you go over to Sierra Leone, come over to India, And, you know, this is something that single women can do, amen? We heard from Amy Carmichael tonight, right? She was single her whole life, and she was the most like Jesus than any missionary, amen? And there are single ladies in this church that you can come to India, you can go to Africa, and you can live for a year, two years, and then after two years, you can figure it out after that, right? I didn't even go to college, amen? Huh? I just got an English as a second language degree, I know how to teach English, and I, get, I can get paid to teach English, right? Because I have an ESL degree, and I have no other college. I have Bible college, amen? That's all I got. I got no other skills. I worked at Phelps Tool and Die, amen? I know how to do tool and die, but that doesn't work over in uh, India. So I just have to teach English and preach the gospel, amen? You all don't even have to go to college, amen? You don't have to have all these college Uh, what is this called? All these loans, right? Just get an English teaching degree and go over to Zambia, go to Vietnam, go to India, and preach Jesus Christ. And you'll have an exciting life. And you'll meet your spouse over there, right? You'll get married over there, amen? Don't wait. Oh, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have this big old house. I'm going to have two dogs and a cat. No. Give away your dogs and cat and go to the mission field, amen? Amen. So let's pray. Let's pray for that. Dear Father God in heaven, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you sent Jesus from heaven, that Jesus had to leave it all. Jesus left the riches, and he came down to dirty earth. So let us leave the riches that we have and go somewhere. Let us go to a place where they need Jesus Christ. Even right here in Missouri, there are people downcast who need Jesus Christ, and you're going to send us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, give him, give him some love. Woo! All right, all right. Let's stand together as we conclude the conference tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please stand together. Heavenly Father, we continue in prayer as we think about all that we've heard tonight. We're thankful for uh, what Doug has brought in the encouragement and the stirring of the Holy Spirit of God. As we conclude now, I pray, God, if there's one under the sound of my voice tonight that doesn't uh, know the Lord, I pray they get saved. That obviously is every time we meet, we want to see that. But on Wednesday night at the conclusion of the vision conference, specifically tonight, Lord, I know that you're stirring after a message like this and you're stirring in people's hearts and you're you're bringing people to points of decision. Lord, you're stirring in my heart. Lord, this is the type of, of conclusion we need. We need to come to the point where we're willing to just give up and let you have us. And Lord, tonight as as we conclude, I know it's late and I know it's long, but Lord, I really can't pass this opportunity. If there's one tonight or two tonight or three tonight that need to come forward even now and just really give it to the Lord and just lay down and, and, and put that down and say, Lord, here am I, send me. I have counted the cost and without you, Lord, I can do nothing, but with you, Lord, nothing is impossible. Take me, use me, direct me. If that's you tonight, Heavenly Father, I pray God you would just move these out Right now, literally come down, and one of the pastors will pray with them at this hour, or they will get the commitment, get connected, get directed. 
as they come to a place of, of decision, even tonight, a place a, of a landmark, a pillar. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. This is an altar call, not for salvation. This is a, a calling call, right? This is a call to all to respond to what God is doing in your heart. If I could have the pastors come up, uh, one or two. If you need to step out by faith right now, we have a missionary pathway. I mean, Doug has laid it out. If you need to get on it, let us know. Let us know. Anyone at all. The offer's on the table. I remember walking down aisles and kneeling down and praying and doing business with God at conferences just like this. And if God's calling you to do it, you need to do it. Anyone at all. God's calling you. I'm not saying you got it all figured out, but you know you need to go. Maybe you do need to sell your house. Maybe you just need to get your affairs in order. Maybe you need to go back to Andy's class on budgeting. Whatever it might be, don't let this time pass without answering the call. It is an exciting life. But it's not just about that. It's, it's what glorifies God. It's the why. It's loving your enemies as yourself, as we learned the other night. It's what am I doing right now? Am I willing to go take it to the streets this weekend? Am I willing to adopt a street? Am I willing to get in on 300 houses? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to go and teach in the children's ministry? Am I willing to do discipleship? Am I willing to get baptized? I mean, you just know what the next right step is. And you know right now that if you don't take it, you're saying no to God. And if God's calling you to say yes, you need to answer him. Heavenly Father, we thank, we're so thankful for the work that you're doing in our hearts today. Thank you for the work you're doing in Doug Pearson's heart. It's encouraging, it's stirring, and it's been stirring, and it's been on fire for years, for decades now. Lord, that is of you. It's a burden of the word of the Lord. And Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would give us that burden, that passion, that vision to reach the world right where we are, make the decisions we need to make to take the trips to Zambia, to take the trips uh, to, uh, to Liberia, wherever you call us to go, to take the trips to India next, this next year in 2025. Maybe, Lord, I, I pray, God, even tonight you would call some men to, to go to India in 2025. We, we've got to get there. Lord, we've seen how fruitful it is when we obey and when you call us and we respond. Lord, many maybe feel like it's somebody else's uh, call. It's somebody else. And Lord, tonight you need us all to know I'm not talking to somebody else. I'm talking to you. Lord, may we own this. May we take it personal. May we, like Jeremiah, say, hey, it may not make sense, but we're going to do it by faith. Because the call of God is bigger than all the other things going on in the world, in our American life. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to get our focus on you and run our race and finish our course so that you get all the honor and the glory and the praise. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. It's been a great conference. I'm not going to tarry. We've got to get our kids out of there. But thank you, Doug. Thank you, uh, pastors. Thank you, Andy, for tonight. This has been another great night. Thank you. If you're stirred in your heart and you know you need to answer the call, Man, make sure you grab your ABF pastor if you're, you need to be in an ABF. That's another thing you need to follow. If you're not in ABF, get an ABF. Uh, get a hold of your ABF pastor. Get a hold of myself. We will get you connected and directed. I want to thank the AV booth. Man, great job this week, guys. Man. <laughs> Woo! Mike Blake in Maple City. Make sure that we, we give the love to those folks and give them some love tonight. Even if you don't have kids over there, go hug them, love them, thank them. Uh, all the folks that prepared food, all the folks that did admin, behind the scenes admin work all week long. I mean, it's been a lot. So we just thank you. Uh, let's praise the Lord and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for all that you've done.
We thank you for just bringing us together around your mission. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would be faithful in purchasing the field just as Jeremiah was. And Lord, we know that you can go and, and do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think, even though it's bigger uh, than any one of us or even one of our churches. Lord, it's able, it's possible because with you, nothing is impossible. Lord, help us to be stirred up tonight by what we've heard and help us to take it beyond this moment into the next day, into the next week, into the next month, into the next year, into the next decade if the Lord tarries. Lord, may we be uh, fully persuaded in our hearts and minds and be given over fully uh, to your call to take the gospel everywhere you've called us to go. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would just empower us, that you would protect us, and Lord, that you would provide uh, as only you can to accomplish your mission and your power for your glory. We thank you for this conference. We thank you for all hands that have been involved in it. We thank you for the living history examples. Lord, it's just been tremendous. We praise you. We give you the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you for coming.